Good evening, my northern friend. How are we getting on? I'm not too bad, good sir. I'm not too bad. I'm, I'm excited for tonight. Yes, it should be an interesting one, to say the least. Uh, Justin will be joining us about half seven, but uh, we just get set up and get the ball rolling beforehand, you know, ourselves. Yeah. yeah. See, being new to this, I don't really know too much about the MP. Just mm -hmm. what you hear, you know, from time to time in the Audrey story. So it'll be good to hear directly from Justin and maybe be able to field him a few questions from somebody that's new on the scene, you know? Yeah, yeah. Well, look, if you joined recently, like you're not really going to know much about the MP other than the drama. Do you know, the stuff you've seen in the press about the gold and the, the leadership struggles and stuff like that. So the way I yeah. see it is there was only one side of the story being told. So tonight, hopefully, we'll hear the other side. Yeah, I think everybody's entitled to, even if you disagree with people, that's the most important thing, I think, is if you disagree with somebody, you need to hear what they're saying. Mm -hmm. you know? And then if you don't agree with it, you can call it out, you can laugh at it like we do. Or, but not hearing from people at all, I don't think that's good. Because then people get pushed into a corner and then, you know, it's like a little echo chamber. So mm. let's see what he's got to say. Yeah, I saw GT chatting with um, uh, Ewan McKenna there, like right. a lefty on Keith's face. That's, that's it. Like, that's what we need to be doing. GT, I've sent you an invite there to speak if you want to come up with Cara. But uh, yeah, that's it. Like, this, you know, this... The, Having more information is never a bad thing. That's the way I see it. Having more information is never bad. How can that be a bad thing? So tonight, the goal of this is to give everyone listening more information, and you can all go forward and make your own decisions. Then I won't be, I won't be um, declaring loyalty to either side. That's not what this is about at all. It's simply about putting out information, and I think everyone, everyone should have access to the full story. Yeah, and everybody should make their own mind up and make their own decisions. Like, I was saying there, I'm only new to this. Like, the only other story I heard of the MP was them getting attacked. Do you mm -hmm. know that? They're sort of the way, like, you know, there's a lot going on there that maybe needs to be talked about as well. It doesn't get talked about, I don't think so. I'm excited for it. GT, how's things, be friend? He's all talked out. No, no, sorry. No, uh, technical issues all night. I kept, my, my feed kept dropping out. Uh, yeah, I heard that. Like a nightmare. I don't know if it's my wife or whatever, majigamy. Yeah, all good, chaps. All good. Like you say, interested to hear from the other side, as always. I wouldn't have an opinion on it. And as Michael said, it's good for people to familiarise themselves, even in the midst of a, a leadership challenge or whatever the drama may be. It's just unfortunate the timing as all these things are, but I think there's a valuable uh, opportunity and a lesson to be learned here and how we go about this. And it's exactly it's giving voice to people that you don't necessarily agree with all the time. So you can hear their ideas. Is what we were saying, in essence, on the far side there. And then just encouraging that gap between people of um, supposed oppositional points of view, but having no facility to have that space to to uh, work it out and here we are in another space uh, following along the lines of the, the National Party now to give it a little bit of context just from my understanding the National Party were on the back end of a hammer attack that were an established political party and bring it into a, 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 a new a new event like the recent doll, uh, call to the doll and, and the, the pearl clutching and all the hysteria that followed it uh, after should be a clear delineation for people even new to, to see how the reporting on that uh, an established political party having their art fish were attacked by hammers and hospitalized as opposed to someone being jostled jostled outside on Kildare Street with full public order uh, full uh, camera in situ the, the, the whole lot but the, like I say the delineation is the, the reporting the fairness in the reporting is becoming more and more apparent and that's why these conversations and spaces are available is about that we can portray and show the information that they have not uh, had a chance uh, to to go through and I commend you boys for bringing Justin on Yeah well look I don't think it's any um, I don't think it's any secret that myself and Justin have had disagreements in the past but like this you know it's bigger than any one individual what's happening in Ireland at the moment, and especially stuff that's happening on our side. So 
that kind of stuff has to be pushed to the side and, and these conversations have to happen as far as I can see. Uh, Toby, you take over there for a second. I just have to get a message there from Justin. Yeah, to just talk on the point there that GT was making is about language is very important. And we talked about jostling and that's what, all that happened. And at the start, it was some mad, violent event. And you've seen the, the, the mainstream media and stuff changed their story. And then it came from violent event all the way back to jostling. And that came from people on Twitter getting the videos out and commenting underneath the stories and saying, like, there was no violence here. Some point, somebody got pushed in the back. Maybe there was a bit of jostling. The phone incident, you know, the phone was stolen at the start. And if it wasn't for people on Twitter and people getting together and forming teams or whatever it is and getting that information out, that, that their whole story was blown apart in a day. You know, they were trying to make that January 6th in Ireland. And we just pushed back that hard with the information that they had to walk back. And I read the Irish Times. I love reading the Irish Times and going, oh, they're using our language now. You know, if they say to the Irish Times, jostled, I just screenshotted it, sent it into one of the group chats. And I said, there you go, lads. You see, we are influenced on what they're saying now, which is, which is a good thing. And that's why I think having Justin on tonight and hearing what he has to say, it's, it's just a good thing. Like. Also well, gives people an opportunity to understand and hear uh, Justin and, um, and hear from his point of view because often the, in the melee the voices get lost, you know, with everything going on. So, you know, it's a, it's only a problem. And I mean, the valuable lesson is for for our side is to air the dirty dishes, I suppose, or get the get the uncomfortable conversations out of the way because we know we have more pressing issues at hand, and this this. Uh, this situation needs to, to be resolved and only by doing that, but by bringing it out and giving all, all participants a chance to explain their situation so that, again, the general consensus can be, come up, can be achieved and if the right leadership is put in place and the party gets up and running again and people have faith and confidence before the local elections, then it, it all gets up and running. But if we keep it in the background, if we keep it in a hearsay conversation or we don't allow one side to view and we just allow it to trundle on, then we're just as guilty as the other side by, by you know, not allowing dissent or oppositional points of view to uh, to take place. Cheerio, I've got to go a bit, a bit of dinner, so I'll be tuning in from here on in. I'll step out of the way for a bit. No buyer, thanks, mate. Um, yeah, just on your point there, like, that's that's it. And these conversations are better being had, had in public, you know, um, had in front of everybody. Let's everybody hear and let's everybody listen. And we can, again, we can all make our own minds up then. You know, as long as we all have the information. So I'm just waiting on, there he is now. I'm going to invite to speak. So Justin, if you hit the uh, request to speak button on the mic there at the bottom left, it should bring you in. Just bear with us a moment now, folks, and we get him up here. So you're shown there as a listener, Justin. I'll send you an invite, and then as soon as you hit the mic button, you should you should be added then as a speaker. And this is where I mentioned to you earlier, Twitter might ask you to approve microphone permissions to grant access to the microphone. Bear with us, folks. Technical issues. We'll get there in the end. We always do. I'm sure if they wanted to, to mess with one space, this would be the one, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, nothing to shock me. I'd say it's just that he's just trying to join as a speaker, I'd say. Mm -hmm. Let's see. I'm going to add Rebecca as a speaker as well in case Justin can't get on. And maybe then he can speak through Rebecca's account. But let's see if we can get him on. Uh, yeah, do you want to talk there for a second? And I'll go and get in contact with Justin and see if I can help him out. I'll do this. Yeah. Sing a bit here, Toby. <laughs> Shut you in the heart! <laughs> 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 
damn dollars you give. Come on, join in, folks. Right, see you, Tony. <laughs> I see, uh, just while we're waiting there, I was just reading a news story. Uh, Helen McEntee is going to force the Gardaí to work. You know, it's oh, he's gonna, he's just going to be forced to the overtime if he's not going to come in. Somebody's going to have to work. And it's just, I put up a post there, it's fresh in my mind. It's like, they're just, to the Gardaí that are obviously listening, and to anybody else that listens back to this that might know Gardaís, they're doing the exact same to the guards that they're doing to us. They just don't care what the people think, you know, they're just like, nah. We don't care what you think in East Wall. We're going to force these people in. Then Helen McEntee to the guards. Oh, we don't care what you think. You are just going to, he's just going to do what we say. And I was like, that's just not how the Constitution or Republic works. You know, everybody has to be beholden to the Constitution and stick to the laws that are in paper. Like we got rid of a monarchy and all that sort of stuff. And we had a Constitutional Republic and now they're just, they're ignoring it. And the more you look into it, even like our laws are, the EU law is supreme over the Irish law. And representative just, democracy, we're told time and time again, Toby. Representative yeah. democracy. Where are you going with this constitutional republic? You think we're the United <laughs> States? <laughs> well, it's not what we're signed up for. Like, we're not, not, people all say it's all about democracy. I'm like, well, we're a republic. You know, we're different than that. Like, yeah, stupidity. The more you, longer you do this, the more you're paying attention, the more you realise that the people that are screaming against you the NPCs they're just they're not the sharpest tacks the more you pull your eyeballs out and pierce your eardrums because you can't handle the inconsistency and the illig the illig illig all of it all of it yeah I'm not you see at the start before I was really into this I would do I was trying to be standing up for myself against some of the weird shit back in the day and they would have I was like how can you not get this but as you do it for longer you realise that's a tactic of theirs is they just ignore any truth and then you think that you're the crazy one when you're not. Protect the narrative. Protect the protect the, the, the narrative at all costs, even if it goes against what you're seeing in front of your very eyes. Don't break from the narrative because then you're ostracized in fear of cancel culture. They have their own set of rules that keeps them locked in place, like many orthodoxies do. You know, so uh, like the ex-Muslims can't step outside for apostasy. For fear of death, it's the same kind of cultural death threat that they get if they step outside, particularly with the with the, uh, the gender ideology as well. That's particularly vicious as well and stuff as well. Very, very protective, maniacally protected. That's why these conversations are in place. We're, we'll we'll have we'll have the, these all these conversations in the in the public viewing place, and uh, people will be more informed and get their opinion better. Anyway, hopefully Justin will have uh, figured out his technical speak to you, Toby. <laughs> Shut yeah. you the heart! Oh, sorry, I'm singing here. Yeah, when it comes to all that sort of stuff, I think that would be their downfall, right? You know, they're too ideologically in the box now and everybody can see the box and everybody's like, well, you say something outside the box. Like, what is a woman? And they can't do it, you know? It, it, it really affects them now. A lot of people have woke up and there's like the simple questions because of their ideology, they can't answer the simple questions, you know? Well, many, many great uh, giants have gone before us and the left will eat itself. Never a truer thing said. They can't manage, they can't win their own argumentation because it defeats itself. It keeps splitting off into protected classes and then you have to rationalise nonsensical ideas and make them, make them seem true and, and, and apparent. Loads of technical difficulties tonight. We lost GGT. There's paths and waters, and you know we're all we're all pushing back and, and applying ourselves to be the pressure, and it's very uh, badly needed, very badly needed. Yeah, well, just uh, read the message there. Chopper's just gonna be back in a minute. He's gonna try and ring him and try and see if he can get this sorted. But usually these things go off not a hitch, but sometimes they're they're a bit dodgy like this. Should bring a, bring a young Derek up there. Derek Bloy's in the house and a few other, few other voices just fit in. We'll all jump off them and when it gets sorted. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, Toby, just uh, just seeing Derek's name there. I thought you might want to... Yeah, I'll send him on. Just waiting for But there has been a lot like that's been going on the last while. That, like, we haven't had a... We were going to do one last night. And then we were like, look, we'll just leave it for tonight because Saturday night a lot of people are doing their 
then they're drinking and partying and all, so they weren't going to get the biggest crowd. But I sent Derek, to, but we think we have her back in there. I'll send her back in invite as well. Let me see. Oh, so what would what what would you not have to talk about the bus situation, the like hostage situation? I mean, you have to come to these places just to get reprieve from the craziness out there. Right, folks. Sorry about that. Technical issues resolved. So Justin is finding us there under Rebecca's profile. Can you hear us there, Justin? Hello, I can indeed. Yes, yes. Uh, sorry, unfortunately, uh, Twitter uh, isn't uh, allowing permissions on the speaker for me. Uh, so, so I'm in under Rebecca's account, my wife's account. So that's not a picture of me. Uh, but other than that, I think you all kind of know what I look like. Anyway. <laughs> And we're um, doing yes, I'm free doing to speak, doing. free to answer any questions anybody has, whatever. Brilliant you know, stuff. Thanks um, for coming on, first of all. And uh, Toby there is the co-host. I don't think you've met Toby before. And we have GT on Rowan Croft as well. So you know a couple of the guys that are here with us. But uh, yeah, yeah, what yeah. we're going to do is we're going to give you an opportunity to tell your side of the story. And then we have a number of questions that have been submitted. I asked for people to submit questions beforehand. And I'll put them to you then if you don't cover them yourself. So I suppose we'll start yeah. off with the obvious question. Um, what is the state of things with the National Party at the moment from your side? What is the state of things? Um, as of this moment, uh, the Electoral Commission has two submissions uh, given to it. Uh, one from myself and the other from the people who organise the coup. Both sides obviously claiming the leadership and both sides uh, saying that they want the details on the register of political parties changed. Now, the commission has asked for statutory declarations from interested parties. Uh, now, to just to explain what a statutory declaration is, that's the equivalent of swearing an oath. So it's the equivalent of being in the witness box in a court uh, to lie on, uh, on, on in a statutory declaration, which has to be made before a solicitor or a commissioner of oath. To lie is to perjure yourself. Uh, so it's not your average letter, shall we say, that you just send to somebody and you can say whatever you like. Now, um, the Electoral Commission has the National Party Constitution and uh, presumably has the statutory declarations uh, from both sides at this point. And it will be, first of all, for the head of the commission to make a, a preliminary decision, I suppose you'd call it, um, in the sense that he will, he will either excite, accept one or the other as being the true version of what the situation is, or alternatively, he may refer to the full commission, or alternatively to that, uh, if one or other side is unhappy with the outcome, uh, that they might appeal to the full commission. So that is, that is where we are. Um, if you look at the Electoral Commission's website, you will see that it lists both myself and James Reynolds as of this moment as being officers of the party. So I presume, I don't know it for definite because I haven't been talking to him, obviously, but I presume he has requested the removal of my name from the register. I have certainly requested the removal of his name from the register. And I have explained in great detail, I mean, the statutory declaration I made is a full five pages long, uh, in great detail why I have the right uh, under the National Party Constitution to request that Mr. Reynolds be removed from the register and therefore consequently removed from the party officially, legally, as opposed to an internal party matter. That is, the, that, that is where we are. Uh, the statutory declarations are in. Uh, mine is in. Uh, my understanding from the statement that was put out by Mr. Reynolds the other day, yesterday, was that there is only one statutory declaration from their side. Now, that to me is a, a, a rather odd because they claimed there was a meeting on they used to say mid-July, but they finally agreed after two months that it was, in fact, the 14th of July. So, yeah, OK, that's mid-July. 
Uh, but there's only one person who has sworn an oath that what is in their statutory declaration is true. That's to say Mr. Reynolds. And so one would have to ask straight away if there was a meeting on July the 14th, which removed me as party president, why, first of all, was I not present? Uh, why was I not there when I was dismissed? Why, um, uh, uh, who was there? Uh, uh, what right did they have to be there in terms of the National Party Constitution? And above all else, now I'm asking myself this question is, if there was such a meeting on July the 14th, why won't any of the other participants at that meeting, which James says are the leadership of the National Party, why won't they make a statutory declaration? Why won't they swear to have been there? Why won't they swear to what they have said? Why won't they swear to my dismissal and how it was done? Why won't they swear to uh, how uh, Mr. Ellis was elected? This to me is quite extraordinary because, as I say, there was a, a meeting of the leadership, according to them. Now, my understanding of the leadership of the national parties is very tight and it's very narrow, constitutionally speaking. Um, there are many consultative bodies. We, we work through round tables and we work through um, networking of the between the national organizer and various common leaders and whatever. But legally, technically legally, we have been very careful to limit the legal leadership of the party to the national directorate, of which there are only two members um, elected at an AGM. That is to say, myself and Mr. Reynolds. Now, as a sitting president, how can I be removed? by anything, I can only be removed by the, the, the national directors, and I am 50% of the directors. So how was I removed on the day of July the 14th by a directorate that I was not present at, at a meeting that I wasn't there? And how can I be removed by one member of the national directorate if I'm saying, no, that's not okay with me? In other words, the only way I could be removed by the national directorate as opposed to an AGM. The only way I could be removed, my understanding is, is if I either resigned uh, or I agreed with Mr. Reynolds and we both voted that at a national director meeting, which at least the two of us would have to be at as the legal persons, that we voted uh, for my removal and that we voted for his election. The and just a quick question on that. Just on that, Justin, is that in the yeah. Constitution of the National Party? It is. That is in the Constitution of the National Party, yes. And that, that's uh, with the Electoral Commission at the moment? That is with the Electoral Commission and has been with the Electoral Commission. It was previously with the Doyle Clerk when, when they held the register, but has been with them since the party was registered in 2019. So they've had it for some time. It's not something that I typed up on the computer a few days ago and sent in. They've had this now for four years and they've been there. Nobody can change it as such. Now, as I say, there's a second method of removing a president, a sitting president, which is at an AGM of the uh, party membership. And that's where I was originally elected. And that as president of the party. And that's where Mr. Reynolds was originally elected as the vice president of the party. And that's where we get our authority from as the national directorate. Now, where anybody else would get their authority from, I have no idea. They don't get it from the Constitution. They don't get it from an election at the AGM. They don't get it from me because I can't give it to them. I can't appoint a national director. They must be elected at an AGM. Uh, I can delegate certain tasks uh, like the national organizer or a common leader down the country or something like that. But I cannot appoint somebody to the national directorate. What I can do under the Constitution is I can dismiss a member of the national directorate, which I did do. Um, I dismissed Mr. Reynolds in the aftermath of the removal of the party's gold reserves from the party vault 
by himself and Mr. Conroy. Now, I did that on the Sunday after. I, I found that out that it had been removed on the Friday. I, I, I uh, dismissed Mr. Reynolds uh, uh, from the national director and from the party on the Sunday publicly. Uh, after many, many efforts of trying to get to, through to him by phone, by email and text and otherwise, um, uh, no response. He says, I didn't come to his house. Well, I didn't come to his house, no, because his elderly mother lives there. And he says, well, we could have arranged to meet somewhere else on the property. Well, we couldn't have because he wasn't answering his phone and he wasn't answering his texts. The only way that I could have gone to Mr. Reynolds's house was to literally knock on the door. So anyway, gets to the Sunday. I publicly dismiss Mr. Reynolds uh, from the National Directorate and from the party. And I publicly dismiss Mr. Conroy, who had previously been dismissed as a national organiser. And that's a long story in and of itself, but from the party as well. Now, it takes eight days more for these people who have had a meeting on July the 14th, by the way, according to themselves. And they informed the Electoral Commission on July the 14th that they had changed the leadership of the National Party. They didn't inform me on July the 14th. They didn't inform anybody else on July the 14th. They didn't inform anybody on uh, social media, even when I dismissed Mr. Reynolds. They didn't say that's not possible uh, because he's no longer the president. No, they waited. They waited until July the 31st, which is almost considerably more than a week later, uh, to put up a statement seven lines long saying that I had been removed the previous mid-July at some point. Now, this is, a, this is, this is daft. This is daft. Uh, uh, and, and it's daftness at its, at its finest because, <laughs> like, they've, they've gotten some people to actually believe that they held a meeting on June the 14th and they didn't tell anybody about it. That they had the authority to remove me as president, but they didn't tell me about it. That they allowed me to go on social media and dismiss Mr. Reynolds in a very public way uh, on uh, Sunday, the 23rd of July. And they didn't say anything about it. And they allowed an, another entire week to pass by till July the 31st before they responded that, in fact, they, I, I wasn't the leader, I couldn't expel Mr. Reynolds, and, in fact, he had been elected two weeks before. This is, this is gibberish, like, literally, on the face of it, it's, it's, it's gibberish. Uh, never mind your, your familiarity with the, the details of the Constitution or the details of the relationship between myself and Mr. Reynolds or myself and Mr. Conroy or the background within the National Party. You've got people who say they held a meeting on July the 14th and dismissed me as president without informing me. They elected Mr. Reynolds without informing me. Then I, um, I discovered that the party's gold reserves have gone missing. And this is the first time anybody hears anything in public, which is me saying that the party reserves have gone missing and that I know who, where they have gone missing too, that they have been taken by Mr. Reynolds and by Mr. Conroy and that they have been removed to a, another vault box, um, which they now claim they had the legal right to do so based on the meeting of July the 14th. Now, again, that's absurd because on July the 21st, I arrive up to the vaults to find the box empty. And I tried to miss, ring Mr. Reynolds to find out what the hell was going on. Again, obviously, as I said, that day and days afterwards, no answer. They, are, they have been very uh, specific in their attacks in terms of, well, he contacted the guards and there was no need to do that. But I was informed by the vault that the key holder of the other vaults were quite entitled to come in at any point and remove uh, the gold from the vaults that they had. And so that therefore, if I left the premises and didn't call the guards and either Mr. Conroy or Mr. Reynolds came in and simply removed the party gold for good and all, as it were, out of the building, uh, down the country, 
dig a hole in James's backyard, I don't know what, uh, and put it in it. There's nothing more that could be done about it. Um, unless I ring the guards now. If I ring the guards now, the vault owners tell me that the guards can secure a lock on the boxes. In other words, that they can't be opened by anybody except under a search warrant. And because I couldn't contact Mr. Reynolds and I did, I waited several hours outside the, the vault building so as to ensure that um, basically I would see if anybody um, tried to access it again uh, while I was contacting Mr. Reynolds and then while I was trying to contact Mr. Conroy as well. Uh, again, no answer from either of them. I then told them that I had absolutely no choice whatsoever. I was going to have to ring the guards if they if I didn't get some kind of response and some kind of explanation as to what the hell was going on. This is July the 21st, by the way. Uh, I didn't get any response. So, as I said, two days later, I dismissed the um, Paul Conroy from the party altogether, uh, Mr. Reynolds from the National Directorate, as provided by the Constitution, and from the party altogether. Another eight days pass, and there's no communication whatsoever. And then they declare that, while well, James has been the leader all along. Now, in the meantime, there are various media reports, and we all saw them. There's hundreds of them. Um, it was pretty much everywhere. One of the things that was said, and I just want to just want to lock this one down because it's important, is the newspaper stated technically accurately that there was not a criminal investigation. And I asked the detectives uh, about that when I made my statement, my formal statement, the following Saturday. That's the following Saturday after July the 23rd. Um, I said, why is the Garda press office saying there is no criminal investigation when I have reported it to the guards? And he said to me that because you have only made a formal criminal complaint today, that is that Saturday, and you're only signed it today, and it's only a, a sworn today, that technically speaking, there was not a criminal investigation for the past few days. But from here on in, from this moment that you have signed this statement, there is a proper criminal complaint. And because there's a proper criminal complaint, there is now a full criminal investigation. But previous to that, and this is talking about locking down the boxes, is on Garda Khan had got a search warrant and uh, for probable cause that a crime had been committed to open three boxes in the vaults. Uh, one under Mr. Conroy's name, one under Mr. Reynolds's name, and one in their joint names. And they seized the contents of all of those. And that's where the figure of 400,000 that you've heard in the media comes from, I assume, is the contents of all three boxes. Now, it is my assumption, but again, I can't, uh, I can't be sure of this, but it is my assumption that the vault box in Mr. Reynolds' name contained only gold that belonged to him. The vault box in Mr. Conroy's name contained only gold that belonged to him. The third box is the box in which the National Party gold was stashed, as it were, by the two of them. They had no legal right to move it from the original vault and on Garda Khan have assured me that the, it doesn't matter if it was moved for one second or one hour or one day. It doesn't matter if they moved it three feet or uh, 20 miles. Uh, the fact of the matter is if they moved it without authority, uh, that is a crime. And so a criminal investigation is underway. And this is where you come back to the Electoral Commission. Because now Mr. Reynolds claims that he was the president of the party at the time he moved the gold. And if he was the president of the party at the time he moved the gold, his argument is that he had the right to, to move it. And that's what the guards have told me, which is that they have to wait now first on the decision of the Electoral Commission as to who the, the, the real leadership of the National Party was at the time that the gold was moved. Then that will ascertain the ownership of the gold and the authority to move it. 
And then the question uh, will go to the DPP. Uh, in other words, if if Mr. Reynolds was the party president, well, he was quite entitled to move the gold. That's what they say. Uh, but on the other hand, if he wasn't, he wasn't entitled to touch it at all. So it's up to the Electoral Commission to decide, it appears, to decide ownership. If they decide that I am the National Party leader, and constitutionally speaking, I don't see how they can do otherwise, uh, then in that scenario, uh, the criminal investigation, which is an ongoing investigation, will result in a file being sent to the DPP regarding Mr. Reynolds and Mr. Conroy. If they decide in Mr. Reynolds's favour and say somehow, somehow he was the leader of the party based on this July the 14th meeting, I, I presume, um, that in that instance, well, there's no, no crime has been committed. So that's where we are. The Electoral Commission is deciding who is the true, who is telling the truth here, who is the true leader of the National Party according to the constitution of the party. And when that is decided, then uh, the file will either go to the DPP or will not go to the DPP, as, is the, uh, as might be the case, depending on the Electoral Commission's decision. Because either Mr. Reynolds had the right to move it or he didn't. And if he didn't, it's a file to the DPP for criminal charges. If he did have the right to, well, then it's not. A, there's no file to go to anywhere. And there's certainly no file against myself because uh, at no point has anybody accused me of any criminal wrongdoing on any side. So it's with the commission to decide. Uh, but the criminal investigation is ongoing. Now, where is the gold? Um, I, I'll anticipate that question already. Where is it? On Garda Shia Khan have it uh, as of this moment. I believe they have the contents of all three boxes, which is to say they have Mr. Conroy's gold and Mr. Reynolds's gold as well, and that it hasn't been claimed by them, but I'm not sure. There is a Police Property Act under which you uh, apply for the return of property that has been seized by Angarda Shia stating that it is rightfully your property and you have to prove that with receipts and so on and so forth. Now, I can do that. I've already provided Angarda Shia with that. But they say they can't proceed with that until the Electoral Commission makes a decision on who the real leadership was. Because they say whoever the real leadership was um, is the owner of the gold. And that's where it stands both criminally and where it stands in terms of the internal National Party constitution. There are two competing claims, shall we say. Uh, one of them is from myself as, a, as the sitting president, that mm -hmm. if this meeting took place on July the 14th, that it had no authority to take place that it was not a meeting of the national directorate and obviously it couldn't be because a if i wasn't there um then one of the national directors was missing and the electoral commission has but in front of it a statement by mr reynolds a sworn statement from by, by mr reynolds saying something else now i don't know as of this moment what the something else is uh, in terms of who he says granted him the authority to remove me as president, uh, who attended this meeting, um, wh th did he swear that it took place on July the 14th, etc., etc., etc. I don't know. But I am told that if the Electoral Commission has difficulty deciding on who is telling the true story, that my statutory declaration will be delivered to Mr. Reynolds and his to me and we will be given 14 days to respond so I haven't seen what he has said and I haven't seen what he has claimed except what he has said in social media and I guess strictly speaking he hasn't seen what I have said either except what I have said in social media so that's where we are now um, we're waiting uh, on the electoral commission I'm waiting on the Electoral Commission. Mr. Reynolds is behaving as if he is just the party leader, whether the Electoral Commission says he is or not. I don't 
feel that, first of all, I don't feel I have the right to do so because it's a very difficult situation. Uh, it's not legally decided. Um, in the meantime, the national organizer who uh, did not hand over any of the passwords for the social media or any of the props, as it were, that a party uses, like the backdrop and banners and uh, party flags and so forth, they are continuing to be used by people who, as I would say, essentially have launched a coup here. And they are being used by them to present themselves as the ongoing party leadership at a time when the Electoral Commission has stated to both of us that they are reviewing the question of who is the registered proper leader of the National Party. I make the claim, obviously, and I've made the statutory claim, and I make the claim here that I remain the president, the proper president, the proper leader of the National Party. But I have not gone out and um, organized meetings. And I have not gone out, I don't have the party flags, for example, I don't have the party banners, but I have not acted in public uh, as a functioning party when it's quite obvious that it's not a functioning party because most of the party membership don't know as of this moment who to believe either. Um, and they're, they, they have, no more than the Electoral Commission, they have two stories in front of them, although they, what they have is social media stories. And I guess uh, quite a lot of them don't know who to believe. Now, another thing that is being said is, oh, well, look at all the senior figures in the party who have lined up to support James. Well, there are no senior figures in the party except faces that are well known. Uh, they... They don't have positions in the party per se, but there are people who are well known who have supported Mr. Reynolds. I presume they were part of plotting this coup against myself and removing me from the leadership. Uh, there's a very small number of them. Um, uh, Paul Conroy as the national organiser got to choose who was on camera and who wasn't on camera when he was the national organiser. So he got to decide basically who were the faces of the national party. Uh, so therefore, he chose the people who would support his coup in the end when he attempted to carry it out. So that's why the senior figures, inverted commas, uh, of the party are supporting the coup. There are many, many people in the party, and I would believe the vast majority of the membership of the party, who they certainly joined the party, understanding that I was the leader of the party. And on that basis... They, they put their trust in me to lead the party and they continue to put their trust in me to lead the party and they continue to support me. Many, many people who would not be easily recognised if I was to put them up on their photographs on Telegram or something like that, but who have put in the, the backbreaking work over the years of building the National Party, support myself. And I don't doubt that I have a majority support among the party membership. Uh, this is why they launched a coup, for example. I mean, you could have, they could have waited till the next AGM and then they could have put forward Mr. Reynolds as a candidate for the presidency. If they had a majority, they could have done that. And that's what would have happened. I, they knew they didn't have a majority. So did we have this sort of pseudo med up meeting on July the 14th, uh, which had no authority at all. And now we have a situation where Angarda Shia Corner is involved. Now we have a situation in which the resources of the party are in, in physical terms are in the hands of a dismissed national organiser. We have a situation in which the monetary assets, both in terms of cash and in terms of the gold reserves, are in uh, the, the cash reserves are frozen by Bank of Ireland, uh, not accessible to either side. And the gold is in the hands of Angarda Shilkana. And the question of the leadership of the National Party is in the hands of the head of the Electoral Commission at the moment and probably the full Electoral Commission before uh, this, is, this whole matter is finally settled. So, there we are. Right. That's a pretty... Um, pretty comprehensive answer. <laughs> pretty comprehensive yeah. answer. 
Yeah, you don't, don't you don't you're a man for detail. Like, really? you, have, you, you haven't lost your eye for detail. Um there's a few things you, you mentioned there that I want to pick up on, Justin. Um the first no is you just you've described this as a coup and you've you've pretty much explained how this is a coup because from your side, the constitution of, of the party supports you. There's there's it's black and white as far as you can see, and that's what I can see. And this is one of the reasons that I wanted to have you on and, and give people an opportunity to hear you speak because when they launched this coup, they, it was comprehensive. They, they had the social media. So they had the main national party account with over 10,000 followers. They had the YouTube channel. Yeah. And I know, I know for a fact, because I was asked to participate in this, that they, t- they took out your, Dublin, your National Party Dublin base out account, that they got that mass reported. I know that because I was asked to participate in it a few days before all this went public. So this right. is a big reason that I wanted to have you on because I want everyone to hear, not just the side that's coming out to, the, to social media, because that's all we're seeing at the moment is an optical battle. And the, the, you're willing to discuss these facts, but it doesn't seem like the other side are. So the, it's a big reason no, I, I taught you should. They're not. They're not at all. As you said, they're continuing on as if everything's fine. But the reality of it is any of us here right now can go to the Electoral Commission's website, check who are registered on the party, and your name is still there. It's, that's, that's My name is not still there, dispute. and Mr. Reynolds' name is still there. Still there. Uh, Nothing so has changed. It's quite, clear, it's quite clear that there hasn't been an accepted legal change uh, mm-hmm. in the state. Exactly. As of this moment, yeah, and they are saying that no, the change is the change is, has been done and it's over, and they, uh, there's no further question. Um, yeah. Well, there is a further question, the, and the commission agrees that there's a further question, and on Garda Sheikhan, I agree that there's a further question, and I think a lot mm-hmm. of the party members agree that there's a further question. Um, again, I ask myself, who was at this meeting on July the fourteenth, and under what authority did they vote? Because they, it wasn't an AGM, it wasn't a meeting of the general party membership, and it wasn't, although mm-hmm. Mr. Reynolds describes it as a meeting of the leadership, he's, he's, he's playing with words there uh, at the very least because he's expanding leadership uh, beyond the constitutional definition to include everybody he considers important in the party that he considers important in the party, and he's calling them the leadership, I presume. Uh, I don't, I haven't heard any of these people. I've seen photographs of them standing beside Mr. Reynolds. I've seen them shaking hands with him and so on and so forth. Uh, I haven't seen a statutory declaration from any of these people swearing that they were at this meeting that they dismissed myself as president, that they elected Mr. Reynolds and that they had the authority to do so under the National Party Constitution. And this is the section of the Constitution under under which they had such a right and that they were the leadership. So Mr. Reynolds is calling people the leadership who are no more the leadership um, than anybody else in the party. They had certain mm-hmm. positions of responsibility. Uh, they were common leaders. Uh, there are common leaders that are on my side. I haven't asked them to trot themselves out in front of social media um, mm-hmm. in this like fashion. The public nature of this is very reluctant on my part. The the uh, ring of Angarda Shiakada was... The one, probably one of the most reluctant things that I have ever done in my life. But oh, I know I you, <laughs> you wouldn't have enjoyed that call. <laughs> exactly. I mean, you know, I have been through my trials and travails, literally trials and travails with Angarda Shiakana over many years, going, going way back to when I was involved in the pro life movement. Um, still haven't got a conviction. I don't know how, or they haven't got me under something, but they haven't. Um, so it was one of the most reluctant decisions I've ever had to make. But on the other hand, here I was. I'm standing in. I'm standing in the, in a street in Dublin, and the party's gold is gone. Now I know that I am responsible for that gold because I am the party leader. Not only that, is I have a document uh, uh, which says states, and it's signed by Mr. Reynolds as well. 
I have a document which states that I am the Justin Barrett is the legal custodian of the National Party's gold reserves. And I am told by the vault owners that there are three other boxes which have contents that they're not sure what those contents are, but that if the key holders come back for them, that is to say Mr. Conroy and Mr. Reynolds, they have no way of preventing them from removing the contents unless on Garda Siakona intervene. And so I, 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 I wait, I keep ringing, I keep texting during two, two and a half, even three hours, I'd say. And, and when I got no response, I rang on Garda Siakona. They came down. They gave the vault uh, the authority to lock the boxes. On the following morning, I presume... Um, a district court justice, uh, because that would be the, the minimum required, a district court justice uh, granted them a warrant under probable cause that a crime had been committed to forcibly open the three boxes. They removed the contents and they are now in guard of possession. And they will be returned. It seems to me they will be the contents of those boxes Will be re- will be returned to will it, the the money that belo- the gold that belongs to Mr. Conroy will be returned to him if he can prove he he has the receipts for it and if he can prove that uh, the money he used to buy it was legally acquired. Uh, same thing with Mr. Reynolds. Um, if he can provide the receipts as to where he bought the gold, then he can provide uh, the source of the cash. It was used to buy it. And that's fine. That's fine. I have no problem with that. If they can do that, that's theirs. That's their business. But I'm responsible for the National Party's gold reserve. Personally responsible. And I have to make sure that uh, nobody who is not entitled to it uh, literally goes off with it. And so that to do. On his hands, they say it would be up to the electoral commission to decide who is the true leadership of the national party, and therefore the true leadership of the national party is the true custodian of the gold. Right? Okay, I'm not terribly sure because, as I say, I have this document which says, uh, which signed by, by my, both myself and Mr. Reynolds, which says I am the legal custodian by name. I am the legal custodian of the gold. But we won't get into that because I'm not that interested in that yet because I do believe the Electoral Commission has literally no choice here. Uh, it's in very black and white. I don't even know why there is a, a conflict of, of interest that they have to give consideration to here. Uh, I think yes, it's so do. very no. straightforward. Just, just to jump in, yes, you do. Any opportunity for the establishment to get at any of the new nationalist parties, they will take it. So that's exactly what they're doing here, as far as I believe. Um, well, yes, is, this, is the only way I can answer that. Yes, that's where the doubt arises. It doesn't arise in the black and white of the National Party Constitution. It doesn't arise within the context of the facts as they exist. It does arise in the context of the gold is now in the hands of Angarda Siakana. The decision is in the hands of the Electoral Commission. Both of those are state bodies. Um, We can ask ourselves at what level the decision uh, will, will be made by Angarda Siakana. In other words, will it be made by the detective I was talking to? It's highly unlikely it will, ultimately. It'll be, it'll be made much further up the line. And who knows how far up it'll go? Maybe it will go up as far as Drew Harris. I don't know. Um, but the Electoral Commission certainly is another state body, and, uh, and they are going to make the decision. So there's where the doubt lies, because it is within their power, shall we say, to make a corrupt decision here. It is within their power and their interest to make a corrupt decision here. So there's where the doubt arises. There would, otherwise, there would be no doubt. But there's where the doubt arises. Are they going to give the leadership to 
Mr. Reynolds, despite the Constitution and despite the facts? Or are they going to do, which they have suggested, is another third possibility. Are they going to deregister the party and refuse to declare Mr. Reynolds the leader of the party or myself as the leader of the party legally and leave that dangling in midair? If they do that, um, the whole question then of who owns the gold presumably moves on to the courts. And again, we have another state body, another like um, corruptible, if not corrupt, uh, um, place and people who are going to make the decision. And so, therefore, yeah, I, I can't be sure of the outcome. I can be sure of the facts. I can be absolutely 100% sure of the facts. Of course, I know the facts. I know all of the facts. I know them in detail. And as you said, comprehensively, I remember them. They're etched into my memory. If they were branded by a hot iron, they couldn't be more branded into my brain. The details of what has gone on over the past two months. But what will the Electoral Commission, which... I don't trust the side. What will on Garda Siakana, which I don't necessarily trust either, decide? At what level of on Garda Siakana will it be decided? Because if it goes all the way to Drew Harris, I don't, I don't expect anything other than a corrupt decision. If it goes to the DPP's office, uh, will there be a corrupt decision from there? I don't know. If it goes to the courts, will there be a corrupt decision from there? Again, I don't know. All I know is the facts. What astonishes me, what astonishes me here is uh, the behavior in particular of Mr. Reynolds. Now, I could say Mr. Conroy as well and various other people who are who have confused the hell out of me in the sense of I thought they were friends of mine. I thought they were loyal to me. I thought they were loyal to the party. They never gave me any indication that they weren't, uh, including Mr. Conroy, right up until the point that he refused to bring the banners to the um, pro-life rally. Uh, he was the nas- he was the sitting national organiser. He had previously resigned, by the way, and I asked him to come back. I asked him to come back um, and to withdraw his resignation because I thought he was a valuable and loyal member. And he was there since the beginning. And I regarded him as a friend, but not a friend in the same way as Miss Reynolds, whom I know for like 30 years, 30 years easily. Um, I'm not counting the days uh, exactly, but for a very, very long time. And as he says himself, uh, before he goes on to tell a, a, a... rather grubby and nasty story, which is not altogether true either. Uh, but uh, he, he has seen me at my best and he has, I suppose, probably seen me at my worst. Uh, I've seen him at his best and at his worst as well, but I'm not going to talk about his worst. And no matter what happens as we go through this process, I will never speak about what I know about Mr. Reynolds at his worst. Because Mr. Reynolds at his worst, uh, as far as I know him for the past 30 years, was not until July the 18th of this year uh, guilty of any kind of a criminal act. So uh, there's stuff I know that would embarrass him. But to my certain knowledge, he has not been guilty of a criminal act up until that day. So why, where, where is it my place to be telling the personal details of his life, to be broadcasting them? And when you broadcast on the internet, you have to remember, I mean, that you have a certain audience, right? And that, that's in practical terms, the number of people who will actually hear an accusation you make against somebody. But in real terms, it is possible for absolutely anybody in the world who has internet access to hear the accusations that you make. And Mr. Reynolds decided to take a matter that was very personal and very hurtful, but very embarrassing. Yeah, very embarrassing. Um, Not proud of that night and not 
particularly proud of my behavior around that time. But a very personal matter, uh, not a criminal matter, not a political matter, not a public matter of any kind, but very personal, very private. And, and he decides to broadcast this literally to the entire world. That is the shock. That I cannot, I cannot understand that, and I cannot get over it. I know Paul Conroy had grievances. I know other people in the party had a different points of view on various things. But that personal betrayal goes beyond politics, goes beyond ideology, goes beyond the public arena, goes right to the very core of who you are as a person that you would take something that was otherwise a secret, essentially, and just, there you go. Because Mr. Barrett, Justin Barrett, I've known him for 30 years, he will be mortified. He will be crippled with embarrassment. And that will probably cause him to withdraw from public life. And my coup will succeed. And that's why he did it. That's the only possible reason he could have done it, is to believe that I would feel so so humiliated, and I do feel humiliated, I can tell you, that I would feel so humiliated that I would withdraw from public life entirely and simply let the coup go ahead. Mm-hmm. And that, I believe, was the purpose. But having said that, it took them two months to come up with this story. It took them two months to come up with the story that they came up with the other night in Miss Reynolds' speech. Um, And then the following day, uh, when I admitted that those parts of the story that he told that night that were true, uh, what's caught as embarrassing as they were, and Mm -hmm. they published another statement that night listing another series of accusations, uh, all of which unless I'm very much mistaken, uh, we can go through them in in more detail, but uh, all of which were untrue, completely untrue, made up of whole cloth. And of course they were, and people should ask themselves. And this is why when when I went to my telegram that day, um, I went, right, should I answer these accusations one by one? And I said to myself, well, I could do that, but I did that the day before. And the problem with this is that he can make up more accusations tonight. Uh, The coup leaders can make up more accusations tonight. And I will be expected to answer them tomorrow. And then the day after, they can make up some new ones. Because now they're not just embellishing the truth. They have left the truth behind completely. They're just making stuff out, 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 out of thin air. For example, then on the night in question that the incident that the uh, that Mr. Reynolds refers to, uh, there was no ambulance call that night. I was drunk. I was very, 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 very drunk. <laughs> I was in my house. I was very drunk. Um, How dare you? Neighbor, How dare you? <laughs> and, and a neighbor and Mr. Reynolds uh, broke in through the window. And I'll tell you why they found me in the hallway. He says in my underwear. Um, I think, I think, uh, what's got, let's just on a point of detail here. I think Mr. Reynolds might be a bit old fashioned on what constitutes pajamas, right? <laughs> because I was in what I wear in bed, right? And maybe, maybe, uh, what's got, maybe he prefers the, the more old-fashioned woolly pyjamas or something. I don't know, but he, he regarded it as my underwear. It wasn't. I'll tell you what I was doing, though. I'll tell you, I'll, okay, because I can remember it as clear as day, and this is, I'm supposed to have been passed out drunk. I was not passed out drunk. I was sitting in the hallway. This is not easy for me to say, but I'm going to because I'm going to, I want to tell the, the full and total truth. I was sitting in the hallway, of my own house, drunk, very drunk, looking at a handprint that my five-year-old boy had left on the wall before he was removed from my custody some six months before. And it was short, it was around Christmas time. And I was sitting in the hallway, very upset, sitting beside this handprint. 
and feeling very, very sorry for myself. Very sorry for myself, missing my children terribly and sitting beside this emblem, I guess, of them uh, in the handprint that my five-year-old had left. And uh, I have subsequently summed up the courage many, many years later to paint over that handprint, but it took me a long time. It took me a long time to be able to do that. And that's where Mr. Ells found me. And that's the story he decided to tell. That is nasty. That is nasty, nasty stuff. And I don't know where that amount of hate comes from. And that's the only way I can describe it. Because for me to tell that story about somebody else, I would really, I don't have anybody that I hate enough that I would tell that story to about if I found them in the situation that he found me. Now, there was no ambulance calls and I, they, I wasn't suffering from um I wasn't suffering from hypothermia and I didn't thank him for saving my life because he didn't save my life. But I did thank him for his motivation at the time in believing because he hadn't been able to contact me by phone for several days. And he said he was worried about me and that uh, and that he wasn't able to gain access except through the window of the house. And right, OK, I'll take him at his word. Uh, that's what happened at the time. And that's where he found me. And that's what happened. And that's humiliating. And that's embarrassing. And he can add to that story that it wasn't the only time I was drunk. Yeah, it's that's true too. Absolutely. I'm, again, not proud of it. Uh, I got drunk quite a lot around that time. The end of a relationship with a woman that I had uh, several children with. Uh, she took the children with them. Um, I was seeing them on an intermittent basis um, up until I started my the relationship with my current wife and uh, my first wife, my only wife, uh, Rebecca, which is, uh, you can see her picture on your screen right now because I'm using her uh, uh, Twitter uh, to to engage in this broadcast. And uh, from that time, I was banned from seeing my children altogether. And uh, they were very hostile. Uh, they, but around the time of the breakup of that relationship and afterwards, I drank quite heavily, quite a lot. Uh, it's very historical. It's very historical. It's very personal. Um, but I have to say it because Mr. Reynolds has given a version of it. So I have to say it out loud in public. It happened. It happened more than once. Um, there were no crimes committed. I didn't drink and drive. I didn't uh, violently assault anybody. I didn't. I, I sat at home. As you do when you're in this kind of a state, feeling sorry for myself, and maybe that's not what I should have done. I should have, I should have um, made, been... Pulling myself together uh, with a view to being a better father to my children. That's what I should have been doing. And that's not what I was doing. I was drinking. And that's embarrassing. And as much as I tried to pull myself together, it took me a while to do so. And I stopped drinking um, altogether. I stopped drinking intermittently, obviously. You know, I was going on binges. But uh, I stopped drinking altogether in June of 2009. And from that time onwards, um, I don't drink. I, I don't drink. Uh, I won't avoid a sherry trifle. But I, other than that, I don't drink socially because I can't. Because I can't risk falling back into that pattern of behavior. Now, if somebody's going to come on and say, well, are you an alcoholic? Well, I don't know and I'm not about to risk it. There's, there's my answer to that. Is I don't know and I'm not about to risk it. But I will say this much. Is that if I, I do believe if I were an alcoholic, I do believe if I were an alcoholic, I would be very drunk right now. <laughs> I would have been very drunk for the past two months. And I do think that 
the coup were kind of depending on that. I think Mr. Reynolds informed Mr. Conroy, and indeed everybody knew that I had had problems with alcohol, historically speaking, is they all assumed, uh, what's called, under enough pressure, under enough humiliation, under enough embarrassment, the man will fall apart and he will start drinking. And I presume an alcoholic would be have done that by now. Um, I have not. I don't say that's proof that I am not an alcoholic, but I, ha- I, I have not drank uh, through my way through this. It would be a very painless way for me to get through it, but it wouldn't be very productive for the National Party. It wouldn't be very productive for my family. It wouldn't be very productive for Ireland. And indeed, it wouldn't even be very productive for myself personally, but it would be painless. I have chosen another path, a much harder path, much more difficult path, which is to reveal this inner part of my life in the most public way, because I have been forced to do so, in order that I can hold my head up high and say I worked my way through that and that I am the leader of the National Party and that I have Ireland's cause and Ireland's national interest at heart. And that that is the most important thing, apart from my wife and children, to me in the entire world, is the country. And that because of that, I would not take the painless way out, as it were, by drinking my way through it, or I would not take another painless way out, which is to simply just drop the whole thing, just leave it, let them do whatever the hell they want. I have a responsibility to the people who made those donations that created that gold reserve, uh, not to leave it in the hands of people who have shown themselves to be of the poorest of character, the very poorest of character. Um, It is not yet decided uh, uh, whether, like on by on Garda Shiakot or by the DPP, whether they have committed a crime. It's not decided by a court by whether they have committed a crime. But I'll say this straight out. They committed a crime. They committed a crime in law and they committed a crime in against nationalism. And they committed a crime against Ireland. I say, and I say this as clear as day, they stole the National Party's reserves with a purpose and mind of ensuring that along with the social media and along with the props and the banners and the flags and otherwise of the National Party, that they could pull off a coup and there was nothing I could do about it. And whatever happened to me, they didn't really care. What what happened to Ireland, I don't know. I don't know what they planned. I don't, I don't, I, I doubt if they have a plan, except that, uh, as I say, Mr. Conroy has a grievance that he was dismissed as a national organizer. I don't know what James's grievance is. I don't know. It seems from the, if you listen to him stumbling through his speech the other night, we can hear that uh, uh, he thinks I, I felt intellectually superior to him and that I gave him that uh, general impression that I, that I thought that he was stupid and whatever. Um, Maybe I did. Maybe I did. Maybe maybe over the years, you're 30, you know, you, if, if you know somebody for 30 years, if you haven't called them stupid at least once, you know, maybe I did. And maybe he is nursing at, at that grievance, uh, what's called, at some time that he feels that I put him down, uh, uh, you know, in some way. I don't know, but I don't understand it. Because as of the beginning of July, and literally the beginning of July, because I was talking to James Reynolds at the pro-life rally. At the beginning of July, there was absolutely no issues between myself and Mr. Reynolds, of which I was aware. And then there's supposed to be this meeting 14 days later. Then on the 18th, I know for a fact, they stole the gold from the party box and moved it to another box, which they are now saying was now the party box, in fact, uh, because they had changed who, would, who the party was. I don't just know. Just to come in on the gold, Dustin, if you don't mind. Sorry, just to interrupt you for a moment. 
First, let me just commend you, yeah. right, for what you've just spoken for the last 15 minutes. It's not easy to speak personally, especially speak personally about times of vulnerability. So it's a shame that they brought it to that level, but I commend you for, for speaking about it and addressing it. And we've all had feckin' problems. And listen, I can publicly state that any of the interactions that I've had with Justin Barrett down through the years, I've never seen the man have a drink. So that's my experience with him. Um, the issue with the goal, I want to get more into this. Can you explain to the listeners, because the way the media have portrayed this is Justin Barrett has squirreled away 400,000 euro in gold and he's gathering it all up like a little leprechaun and he's robbing everyone's money. <laughs> can, you explain to, can you explain to people the actual situation there with the goal, the ins and outs, who owns what, etc. What's the national parties? Right. Uh, what's got um, the total sum? Uh, of course, you see, gold price changes over over time, and it's uh, on any given day, it's worth a different amount by a slight degree. Like it goes up a bit, goes down a bit, in and out a bit, you know, but. The original decision was made in consultation. Now, the decision was made by myself, but it was made in consultation with Paul Conroy and with uh, the, the people they are now calling the leadership. They were definitely consulted as to whether this was a good idea or not. Is that for a political party, you have you have donations coming in all of, all of the time and you have membership subscriptions coming in all of the time and you have ongoing expenses all of the time. But... You have elections as well, and elections are suddenly on top of you, and suddenly you need a lot of money very quickly, quicker than you can raise it if you're going to try and raise it, you know, uh, in two weeks. You're not, it's just not going to happen for you. And in practical terms, I went, there's a backlog of money in the National Party account, which is sitting there in, uh, in euro. Uh, it's a significant amount of money to me anyway, not a significant amount of money appears to, uh, to Mr. Reynolds because uh, when we bought the gold, the National Party gold, uh, it was bought for about 40,000 euro. It is now uh, worth in or around forty five to 46,000. Why was it bought? It was bought so as to protect the cash from inflation. Now, whether that was just the inflation that we have endured over the past few years of 8, 9, 10%, or whether that was going to be hyperinflation, that we would have an asset that would be infl inflation-proof and would be available then as a reserve for an election campaign, for example, or anything else that might suddenly require a lot of money and a party as small as ours can't raise a lot of money in a short space of time, but can progressively raise a, a fair amount of money over a long period of time. And so about 40,000 it cost, about 45,000 it's worth now. The rest of the contents of the two boxes, and I'm going to assume here, by the way, uh, that the media are telling anything near the truth. Because I know there was, there was some gold in the party box and there was some gold uh, belonged to Mr. Conroy and belonged to Mr. Reynolds, as well as the party gold. Uh, it was a high trust organization, you know. It wasn't, uh, nobody, nobody thought be, uh, uh, anyone was going to stab anybody else in the back or certainly nobody thought anybody was going to steal anybody else's money um, or gold for that matter. Like I had access, for example, the same way as Mr. Conroy did. I had access to James Reynolds's gold for the past two years and I had access to Mr. Conroy's gold, significantly less than 400,000, by the way. But, but more in the national parties. And I could have, like, strictly speaking, taken it at any time. But having said that, they trusted me. <laughs> God knows I trusted them. So there isn't a problem. There isn't a problem. But I'm going to assume, because I have to assume, that the media report of 400,000 in gold being seized from the three boxes, the three boxes now, not one, the three boxes is the National Party's gold, Mr. Conroy's personal uh, property, and Mr. Reynolds's personal property. So some 360,000 of that belongs to Mr. Reynolds. 
and Mr. Conroy between the two of them. Now, how it's divided between the two of them, I don't know because I, I don't know. I mean, they were, it's not my, it wasn't my responsibility to look after their property. And, I, and I'm not trying to take their property. I'm trying to recover what belongs to the National Party on behalf of the membership of the National Party. So what proportion of that 360,000 odd worth of gold belongs to Mr. Reynolds and what proportion of it belongs to Mr. Conroy? I don't know. Uh, or was it legally acquired? I don't know that either. Uh, what's God? I presume it was. Was it, was it from um, savings, cash, properly acquired and earned. I, I don't know that either, but I presume it was. I'd have no, in, no information to indicate to me that it wasn't. Except one thing is that one issue on the following Saturday, they said that neither Mr. Reynolds nor Mr. Conroy were contactable by them. Nor had they returned to the vaults in any way, nor had they claimed the gold that, be- that definitely belonged to them. At that stage, they had not come with re- their receipts and so on and so forth. So they've claimed, so I, as far as I am aware, on Garda Shia are in possession of 400,000 in gold uh, from the three boxes, of which some 40 to 45,000, depending on, you know, the price of gold on any given day. Some 40 to 45,000 belongs to the National Party and the rest, I presume, properly belongs to Mr. Reynolds and Mr. Conroy. And for some reason, they haven't claimed it. But it's not subject to a criminal investigation by, by my hand anyway, because I haven't accused them and I'm not accusing them of having acquired the guards you would think would just have given it back to them and you would think they would have just come and collected it but they didn't certainly immediately and and while it was all in the newspapers and everything they didn't and some of the newspapers reported that it was the the National Party Gold for example there was one newspaper in particular I think it was the examiner used the phrase it was simply handed back no it wasn't no it wasn't it uh, required a search warrant and it was seized uh, under probable cause of a criminal case. Now, whether probable cause turns into an actual conviction is another story, but the, certainly the judge was persuaded that there was probable cause for a search warrant to look for, for 45,000 in gold. And uh, and going through the three boxes, they, the the guards appear to have found four hundred thousand in total. That's their business, I guess. Uh, what's got? Well, you know, I mean, Mr. Reynolds is a, a wealthy farmer. I don't, I don't, and, and I'm not a communist, so I'm not. I don't begrudge him the fact that if he's he, he he's a wealthy man, so that's fine. Uh, what's got? No problem with that. Uh, if Mister Conroy has saved up that money from his work, uh, what's got over the years, or saved it for that matter out of um, his confirmation money, none of my business. None of my business at all, um, except to say that the of the four hundred thousand mentioned in the media. If that figure is accurate, if that figure is accurate, then some three hundred and fifty-five thousand to some to three hundred and sixty thousand of that does not belong to the National Party, nor did I ever claim that it was. Uh, and um, and my understanding is that it belongs to Mr. Reynolds and Mr. Conroy properly and legally, and, and there's no problem with that. But it, ha- I, it is also my understanding, which I cannot verify absolutely, but it's my understanding it's still not back in their possession because it is uh, still part of criminal investigation. But the National Party's money is certainly in Gardaí Acorda's hands, uh, or the National Party gold, rather, is certainly in, in, in on Gardaí Acorda's hands because there is an ongoing 
criminal investigation. And it cannot be released back to anybody until the criminal investigation is completed. And the first step in completion of the criminal investigation is the decision by the Electoral Commission as to who the true leadership of the National Party was. And then it moves on to um, to the Gardaí uh, preparing a file for the DPP in the instance where the Electoral Commission finds that I'm the true leader of the National Party. And then whether the DPP decides to prosecute and whether the courts convict. And I don't, I can't, I can't follow the logic there in the sense of, I don't know. Um, that's, that's where, that's the process. If the Electoral Commission decide in their favour, if they say Mr. Reynolds is the leader, I don't know where, I, I, I don't know if I have very many options at that point, other than to just accept this. They were, despite the fact that I know they stole it, despite the fact that that's just a fact to me. I don't know what I can do about that because Ungarda Shia Connor are telling me they're not going to do anything about it and that they are going to consider it um, lawfully moved by Mr. Reynolds and Mr. Conroy and that that's the end of the matter. And now they have custody of the gold, they have custody of the party, they have custody of the registration. They are now the National Party by the decision not of the membership of the National Party not of the National Directorate of the National Party, but by decision of the Electoral Commission. If that's the ultimate outcome, if the Electoral Commission decide that I am the leader of the National Party, I was elected as an AGM, as the leader of the National Party, the members who joined before July of this year understood they were joining a political party in which Justin Barrett was the leader. They have been presented with a political party that they uh, are now members of that where they're told Mr. Reynolds is the leader. At no time was the ordinary membership consulted. We know that for certain. At no time was the national directorate properly consulted except Mr. Reynolds consulted with himself. <laughs> like, I guess. <laughs> On July the 14th, he was a member of the national directorate. Um, there was no meeting of the National Directorate. Who he met with on July the 14th, I don't know. I, I, it does appear there's only one statutory declaration, so therefore no one else is willing to swear to having been there. Maybe nobody else is willing to even say they were there. And that would be an oddity, wouldn't it? Um, if the leadership is just backing Mr. Reynolds but won't actually say they were at this July the 14th meeting where his leadership came into being. And no one will say they were at this meeting, except Mr. Reynolds, or by himself, sitting in his room. Or maybe he hired a conference room and sat in it by himself. I don't, I don't know. But the only competent, there's only two competent bodies who have the constitutional right under the National Party Constitution to decide the leadership of the National Party. That is an AGM of the open membership or the elected members of the National Directors which were, who were elected at an AGM. And that has not happened in this changeover. But it will be the Electoral Commission who is going to get to decide who is the leader of the National Party. And that, that, alone is, that alone is shocking and that alone is disturbing and that alone is not good form, to say the least. Let's just, let's just use that phrase. It's not good form. But I have no power over that. I don't have, beyond the fact that I have sworn my statement, I've told the truth, I've presented my case, and now we will see what the Electoral Commission will do with that. But it, it, it's not the membership of the National Party that don't get to decide who the leader is. That's, that's, that's astonishing. Um, the leadership of the National Party don't get to decide who the leader is. Uh, the Electoral Commission does. Wow. Wow. The state gets to decide. So you talk about controlled opposition. It doesn't get more controlled than a scenario in which the leadership of an opposition party to the state regime 
is nominated by and declared legal by a body of the state. That's controlled the opposition. Very... That's the ultimate controlled opposition. You literally nominate the leader of your own opposition and you put him in place and you give him the assets of the party. That's yeah, it's a very important point. Very important. Very important. You know, it's absolutely bizarre. But as I, as I say, there is nothing that shocks me more than the behavior of Mr. Reynolds in this. Um, because I would not, in my wildest imaginings, as I say, I've seen him at his best, at his worst. What I've seen of him, he, you know, he's not a perfect human being, I, not, none of us are. But I would not have thought him capable. I would not have thought him capable of this. And mm-hmm. it was said to me at one point uh, during the run up to this coup um, about Mr. Conroy as well by a somebody who was a so kind of a supporter of his uh, what's caught, but a supporter of mine was kind of an intermediary uh, while while uh, there was arguments about the direction of the, the party should take. And. Um, I said, I, I said, uh, watch God, at the very least, we need to, to have the, 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 the party leader should have the passwords to the social media and uh, and should have access to all of the paraphernalia that the party has. And the national organizer should not withhold that from him. And the person in question said to me is, surely you don't think that Mr. But that Paul Conroy would be so dishonorable as if that if he were thrown out of the party, that he would take the party down as he were left. And I said, oh, no, I don't. I'm not, I'm not accusing him of that. I don't think he would do that. And I bent it when I said it. I don't think he would do that. That would have been about June of this year, some, sometime in June. I said, no, of course he wouldn't. Of course he wouldn't. Uh, he wouldn't destroy the party in order to, um, uh, on a personal grievance. Uh, no, he wouldn't do that. That's exactly what he did. Mr. Reynolds have known for 30 years. Wouldn't have thought he would done, have done it to the National Party. Wouldn't have thought he would have done it to the, Na- the Irish Nation. And God knows, I wouldn't have thought he would do it to me. But he did. He did. And there it is. Right, plain straight in front of you and when the version of the first version of how they uh, Mr. Reynolds became leader of the party didn't wash with people they came up with a second version which was broadcast the other night and then having failed to presumably, I think there must have been a bit of a backlash to that, having failed, presumably, to persuade very many more people of the truth of what they were saying based on the broadcast, they decided to issue another statement, which made new accusations which had never been made before and weren't made in the original. And I presume... I'm going to deal with some of those questions now tonight. Uh, what's God? But I presume by the time I get a Telegram or Twitter tomorrow, there will be another pro- probably a statement from the National Party, and there will like so-called uh, Mr. Reynolds anyway, uh, saying that I did this, 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 and this. Uh, I don't know what that is because he's just making stuff up out of thin air now. So it could be pretty much anything. You'll be, you'll, be a, anything. you'll be a secret socialist or a secret communist by tomorrow. Wait and you see, he'll have pictures of you a communist flag <laughs> it'll, be or a something. Difficult, it'll, it'll be a difficult one. To, it'll be a difficult one to prove since I can produce a published letter in the Nina Guardian from the age of 16 in which which I have, like, of all things in a local newspaper, a bit of a, a bit of an odd kid that I am. At 16 years of age, uh, I write a letter which ends with the line, we will bury communism. <laughs> now, that, was back when the Soviet, that was back when the Soviet Union was still there. That was back when Eastern Europe was still communist and so on and so forth uh, during the Cold War. So 
one hell of a sleeper agent if I'm a communist. One yeah, hell of a putting, sleeper agent. But having, but having said that, I might... I have to hand it to Mr. Reynolds too. He's, he's, uh, he's either changed dramatically or for 30 years he's been lying to me or presenting a personality to me that is not, not his true personality. So either he has changed or I don't know. Uh, but yeah, it's, maybe I am. <laughs> maybe I'm working for the state. Maybe I'm working for Ungarda Siakana. That certainly was a suggestion the other night. I was a guard at tout to use the phrase. Mm -hmm. Now, th this mm -hmm. is interesting because this is, this, is, this is something that emerged out of the aftermath of the attack on the National Party, the violent attack on the National Party at the Ardesh in, um, in the, uh, what's called, last, what, November, November now. Uh, that... I'm now regarded as a guard of tout, but we rang P the PSNI on the day. So, what? Are you allowed to ring the police or not? Uh, are, if what, are you allowed to ring the police when Mr. Reynolds is, is, is assaulted or attempts to be, somebody attempts to assault him? And not only are you allowed to ring the police in the South, uh, in the unoccupied or technically unoccupied territories, but you're actually permitted to cooperate with the PSNI in Northern Ireland, in the occupied area of our country. If Mr. Reynolds is in fear of his life, uh, um, but if the National Party's gold reserves are, are stolen, then you to shut your mouth and you to go nowhere near on Garda Siakana because they're the successors police to the RUC. Or the RIC, really, if you think about it. Going way, way back. This is this this I Garda Tout thing, for example. You know, we're allowed to ring the police, we're allowed to ring the Garda Siakana sometimes. Uh, we're allowed to ring even we're allowed to contact the PSNI. We're allowed to give interviews to the PSNI sometimes, but we are never, ever, ever to talk to Ungarda Siakana about anything that Mr. Reynolds would ever do or anything that Mr. Conroy would ever do. Otherwise, you're grand. Work away. Talk to whoever you like. But if it's, the, if it's a matter relating to Mr. Conroy or to James Reynolds, then you cannot, under any circumstances, call the guards, no matter what it is. No, you can't yeah. do that. That's wrong. That's evil. That's wrong. So that's, that's cooperating with the state. That's a sellout. That's a sellout. It's, it's as a, long as it relates to Mr. Conroy and Mr. Reynolds, it's a sellout. Uh, otherwise, it's fine. Otherwise, it's fine. Just, but that's, that's what you get. You get a, a lack of intellectual consistency from people like this who are resorting to the personal attacks. Um, so you, you shouldn't expect yeah. much more. Uh, in yeah. terms, in terms of um, the second statement is is that the first version of why I was removed uh, as party leader uh, didn't go down that well. First of all, they, they tried not to explain it at all. <laughs> like basically, just make a statement and just let and let months go by and and just do not like just don't explain it to anybody. Uh, then they felt they had to explain it in some fashion and they put out an explanation. And then that explanation doesn't seem to have gone down that well or doesn't seem to have been adequate for enough people or some people anyway. So they put out another one uh, that's different than the original. So that we're now, we have now have three versions from Mr. Reynolds. We have three versions of why I should not be the leader of the National Party. Three different versions and a list as long as your arm of accusations. But three different versions. And that's important because if he had said all of this at once, he had said all of this at once. But we have three different versions of why I am not the leader of the National Party. We have one version of why I am. That's my one. And that's the National Party Constitution's one. And I have not diverged from what I originally said in the beginning, one iota, uh, or in any even minor detail. 
and and you could be forgiven for forgetting a minor detail, but not even in a minor detail has the, my version of what happened changed in the two months or three months is coming on three months now since this whole situation erupted in public that was mm-hmm. bubbling underneath since the the aftermath of the Ardesh. So there you go. That's that's where we are. Uh, um, now, people say, oh, well, why should I believe you, uh, Watscott, and not Mr. Reynolds? Um, I, my simple answer to that is, which Mr. Reynolds are you going to believe? Are you going to believe July the 14th, Mr. Reynolds? Are you going to believe July the 21st, Mr. Reynolds? Are you going to believe uh, September the 27th, Mr. Reynolds, or September the 28th, Mr. Reynolds? Because there's four Mr. Reynolds' versions now, strictly speaking. There's four different versions. And you have one story for me, and you can you can disbelieve it if you want. I don't, so any, anybody who's listening out there can go, look, I don't believe a word that guy says. But you've got to choose between here. If, if you're just going on, who do I believe? You've got to choose between what I have said and four different versions of what Mr. Reynolds has said. Which one of Mr. Reynolds' versions is the one you believe? If you say, I believe Mr. Reynolds, I trust Mr. Reynolds. Reynolds, Mr. Reynolds is the leader of the National Party. Okay, under what version of the story is he? The first one, the second one, the third one, or the fourth one? <laughs> you know, it's beyond me how anybody can, 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 with a straight face, say they have any confidence whatsoever in a single solitary word this man says, where there are four different versions of what happened from him. From him alone, not four different versions from Mr. Conroy. There's no version from Mr. Conroy, by the way. Mr. Conroy is silent as the grave. So he's there is no not paper. a word. No word at all from him. Nothing. Nothing. The former national organizer of the party who says he legally moved gold from one vault to another, uh, i I'm told by Ungardi Siakona, I've not been told that by Mr. Conroy, and nor has anybody on social media been told. Various people have been told various things on the phone and by text and WhatsApp, and there's this rumour and there's that rumour, but there is no public statement from one of the two people um, because he thinks he's entitled to anonymity in all of this. He thinks he's entitled to take control of a registered political party without his name being spoken out loud. Again, wow. (laughs) Like, literally, wow. The audacity to think that you can do that. The average member of the National Party can remain as anonymous as they want. You put up posters quietly, uh, what's got, you put up, le- you put leaflets through letterboxes. I'll, I'll, I'll never reveal your name. I'll never uh, tell anybody that what you did or what you didn't do uh, on behalf of the party. I will never dox anybody. But the national organizer tries to take, or the ex-national organizer tries to take over the party by illegal means and expects to remain anonymous and regards it as doxing, that he is not treated with enough respect to be left anonymous. And he refuses to say anything to anybody in his own defense, except, I presume, privately uh, in phone conversations, in telegram message groups and whatever. I presume he's there and he's saying whatever he's saying. I don't know. But nothing in public and nothing that we can hold him to. Only poor James. <laughs> this is the, again, poor James, right? I, 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 you have to sympathize with the man because he's the only one whose neck is on the line here with the, sta- with the Electoral Commission because he's the only one who's provided a statutory sworn statement. Mr. Conroy hasn't. Mr. Conroy doesn't get, hasn't perjured himself. You know, it's, it's incredible stuff. Incredible stuff. But there, this is where we are and this is what I have to deal with. And I tell you something, I go back to this again. You tell me an alcoholic that wouldn't have a drink <laughs> dealing with what I've dealt with over the past two months. Really? Really? You should be tr- thrown out of whatever 
Alcoholics Union there is, right? <laughs> Your membership. You're, 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 not, you're, not, you're not a very good alcoholic. If you're, alcoholic. you're useless. You're absolutely useless. Uh, to, that you just you're, that you just haven't been on a binge for for since I don't know the first of July. But anyway, that's it, man. All joking aside, um, that's where that's where the National Party is. Its fate is in the hands of the Electoral Commission. It's not in my hands, unfortunately. And despite his pretense that it is, it isn't actually in Mr. Reynolds's hands anymore. Yeah. either. It's in the hands of the Electoral Commission and subsequent to the Electoral Commission, it's in the hands of Angarda Siakona and the DPP, depending on what decision mm-hmm. the Electoral Commission make. And it is out of the hands of any of the members of the National Party as of this moment. That's okay. what I know. They are the facts. So um why have the people lined up with him? There's a, there, there, was there, are there arguments within the party? Were there arguments in the party over the general direction we should take? Uh, what's caught in ideologically speaking and in terms of being more populist or less populist, more ideological or less ideological and so on and so forth? Uh, of course there were. Uh, most of these arguments are civil. Uh, what's caught? They're, they're like friendly arguments, if you want to call them that. They're points of view being put across by various people in the party who are being consulted on their opinions. And that's where I thought we were at. Uh, that people had, there were people who agreed with me and there were people who didn't agree with me. And, uh, but, you know, there are differences of point of view within parties and there are differences of point of view between parties. That's fine. That's not a problem. Um Unless somebody starts to behave dishonestly and disreputably, that's when. Uh, and then when it goes out of the hands of the actual people who are involved in the party and is handed over to the state for decision, that um, that to me is monstrous. To be honest, <laughs> it really is monstrous. But it's the situation that I'm in, and whether he will admit it or not, it is the situation that Mr. Reynolds is in. He is hanging on the word of the Electoral Commission just as much as I am because he has no legal authority unless they say he has and I have no legal authority unless they say I have. And there's not a hell of a lot I can do except stand on the moral point, the moral point that I am the rightful leader of the National Party elected by the membership of the party, and I believe that I continue to be supported by the vast majority of the members of the party, unless, and you see, I can't answer this question because I don't have an up-to-date membership list, unless there has been a mass resignation and unless there has been a mass influx of new members. And I can't answer that question. But but, but, But other than that, the people, who, let, let, let me put it this way, I believe I have the confidence that oh, the overwhelming number of people who were registered, paid up National Party members on the 1st of July of this year. I have no doubt about that whatsoever. And it's what keeps me going. It's what keeps me going because that's what... That's why I won't step back. And that's why I won't say, oh, well, look, uh, ego, put your ego aside. I'm, uh, I tell you what's putting my ego aside is carrying on. If it, if it was a matter of ego, I would drop this because it's doing my ego no good at all. <laughs> it really isn't. It really isn't. Stories like the, uh, that were told the other night, for example, they're doing nobody's ego any good. Accusations that have been made against me privately and not so privately um, are doing nothing for my ego. But for Ireland, to hell with my ego. And if the National Party wants me to be their leader, then I should be. And I believe they do. And that's why I'm carrying on. And that's why I'm going through this legal process, even though I don't particularly trust it. I am hoping that the outcome will be the right outcome. And what I will do if it is not the right outcome at the Electoral Commission stage, I don't really know yet, because it's very difficult to get one's head round 
a scenario in which a black and white paper statement is just flatly denied by a state body and they just push it to one side and ignore it and say, no, no, we have decided uh, that that doesn't matter. Uh, Miss Reynolds is the leader of the National Party based on a meeting that he imagines happened um, with people who didn't have the authority to uh, to have such a meeting. And he was elected by people who didn't have the authority to elect him. And we accept that. I so to, For me to get to that point, uh, I'm not willing to do that yet, to be honest. I am willing to give it a little while longer of being patient with the notion that there is just a possibility that even, even just this, it's a bridge too far for the Electoral Commission. It's too bloody obvious. The corruption is too in your face for them to do it. Because they'll have to explain their decision. And it'll just be too damn obvious that the decision is corrupt. And maybe that's how we won't get a corrupt decision. But I don't know. I do not know. I do not know what will happen. I do not know. Um, it's a Sunday evening now. Um, a letter could come to this house in the morning telling me that, uh, yes, we have decided that you um, are legally entitled to the National Party. Uh, you were the legally elected officer and you were uh, le legally elected National Directorate by the National Directorate. Yeah, that's fine. And then it's done. Will, will Mr. Reynolds appeal that? Well, he, he shouldn't really have been engaged in this argument in the first place. So I don't know will he appeal that. He shouldn't, but then he shouldn't have ever made any claims at all. So what he will do, I don't know. I don't know. And there's a lot of I don't knows here. Um, for me to be definitive, if somebody says, if somebody asks me, for example, what happened in the last two months? I can tell them everything I did uh, from start to finish. I cannot tell them, and I can tell them why I did it. Uh, I can tell, but I can't tell you what, what Mr. Reynolds did or what Mr. Conroy did or any of the other of these so-called leaders did uh, or why they did it. I can't. I don't know. And I don't know what the outcome is going to be. And I don't know what the future is going to be. I know this, that I will remain loyal to the oath that I have given to the National Party members time and time and time again from the public podium, which, by the way, the coup leaders have removed from YouTube in case you would want to compare the speaking style and ability uh, of myself and the various commitments that I made to party members over the years and how well or how badly I have kept them to what we ha had the, uh, the other evening, um, the display that we had the other evening from, from Mr. Reynolds. If you, want, you can't, if you want to compare the two, you can't because they've removed the, all YouTube videos in, in which I deliver public speeches. They're, they are too dangerous. Um, they, can't be, they can't be left there anymore. Um, YouTube didn't decide that. They did. They're too dangerous. Uh, I'll tell you why they're too dangerous, because every damn promise I made, I kept. Everything I've sworn to, I have kept. Everything I have said has been the truth as I have known it. And if I have said things that were untrue, they have been because I made a mistake or I was wrong. For example, the most obvious is I have say, said to National Party members at meetings uh, to, to trust Mr. Reynolds. And uh, I have said to National Party members, you can trust the national organiser. And I have said to them, they can trust this common leader and that common leader, which I now see lined up uh, with, with the coup against the party and against the nation and against the national interest. And that's not a lie for me. I told, was telling the truth at the time. It's what I believed. Was it true? No, apparently it wasn't. <laughs> apparently it wasn't um, because I was, but I, I misled nobody on anything deliberately. If I misled somebody, 
it was because I was misled myself. If I made a mistake uh, in anything I have said, uh, it's because I was of the firm belief that what I was saying was absolutely true at the time I said it. That's all I know. And that's all I can stand over. And that's all that can be absolute in this whole mess. And mess it is. This whole mess that we have now found ourselves in as a party. And, and God knows, outside the party, again, there's the whole nation going to the dogs. And uh, I think um, while I was trying to get through the technical difficulties and whatever, I was listening to a little bit of what Rowan was saying, like or rather overhearing it as I scrambled to get the, the uh, to get onto the broadcast. Is um, meanwhile the nation continues its decline, and the society in general continues to go the wrong way. And the government of the country, the state, the real power, whether we like it or not, continues to behave in the way that it behaves towards the Irish people. And that's outside the party. And the party can do nothing right now. Nothing. It can pretend. It can hold photo shoots. And, um, and, and, and Mr. Reynolds can shake hands with Keith Woods, whom we really don't know very much about. Um, <laughs> I, I I was on one broadcast with Mr. Woods once ever, and I believe I met him in Dublin um, maybe five six years ago. Uh, I think some texts passed through us or through, between us over the years. Um, not a hell of I don't know a hell of a lot about him, but now he's he's a superhero, and everybody is supposed to put their qualms aside about what might or might not have gone on over the past two months because here's Keith Woods. Here's <laughs> Keith Woods. Don't look at that. Don't, don't look at the Constitution. Oh, no, no, no. I'm, Keith. Keith. I'm, Keith. I'm a different Keith. No, he's not talking about you, Keith. <laughs> he's not talking about you. <laughs> <laughs> don't don't look don't look at it. Don't, don't look at the mess. Uh, what's called? We we're 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 winning. We're winning because we've got Keith Woods on our side. Look and up here. That's all look we ever here. need. Oh, I'm not, I'm different Keith. No, he knows that. He's he's talking about t- they brought him into the party. Keith he knows, Woods. I've said he Keith knows Woods you're not Keith Woods. <laughs> oh, it's okay then. Uh, sorry. Relax, <laughs> relax, relax. All right. Okay. Um, grand. Brad, we've settled which so, Keith Woods we're talking about. Which Keith? It, that's, that, Justin, oh, no. that's, more, that's more of this optics game that they're trying to play. You know, having the control of the social media and pushing out someone with a large following like that going, look, look at our shiny new toy. Everyone come over here. Justin's an alcoholic. But they're not willing to discuss the facts of what's going on, which is what you've done for the last hour and 40 minutes. And this is what people are crying out for. Oh, I don't like it. I've been talking that long. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, everybody. No, no, I can for another hour. It's, it's, you, you've given a, a long fairly, story compre- to tell. fairly comprehensive explanation of everything, and that's that's exactly why I wanted to have you on here. But there's also a few questions I want to pose to you because when I put out the tweet, I yeah. said, "Look, if anyone has questions, let me know, and I'll ask them." I'm not showing any bias yeah. towards anyone here. I'm simply here to get information out that I feel has been hidden from the public by the so-called new national party. So. Uh, uh, people have said to me as well, do you trust, do you trust Mick O'Keefe not to have uh, underhand motives? And I'm going, he's giving me a platform to talk. It really, your, your motive, uh, Wads Cars, is, um, is kind of irrelevant, to be honest. Mm-hmm. And the fact that we haven't always in the past is neither here nor there either. Uh, I'm talking on your uh, Twitter space to your audience about my story and mm-hmm. um that's that's not a commitment by you to uh, the truth of anything i have said uh nor uh is it a commitment by me to the truth of anything you ever say i'm not but mm-hmm. we're not bound to each other like we're not getting exactly. married i'm sorry <laughs> even even in modern mm-hmm. ireland <laughs> we're, we're not getting married <laughs> we've had our differences so what? Oh, we so have. what? I've had my truth, differences with a lot of people in, in, 
the truth is more important. And that's all I've been given here tonight is a, is a, an opportunity to tell uh, a, a side of the story in more detail than probably than people have heard previously uh, mm-hmm. that I otherwise would not have the opportunity. And really, I'm not interested. I'm not interested in people's motives, to be honest. I'm more interested in what they actually do. Telling me something, you know, that the, 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 say, the saying goes, their road to hell is paved with good intentions. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Maybe there are people involved in this coup who are absolutely well-intended. Right. They really, really do believe that they are doing the right thing. I don't know how they believe that, but maybe they are. Uh, but uh, the road to hell is is paved with their good intentions. And if you have any bad ones, well, you know, that's neither here nor there. Uh, I don't believe you do. I think you, I, I think we're, what we're dealing with here is very straightforward situation that you have a platform and you want you wanted me to be able to tell my story on it and that's yeah. that doesn't require any further inquiry as to what the history between Justin Barrett or Mick O'Keefe is or what uh, Justin or Mick O'Keefe and the National Party or, or James Reynolds or, or anything else. None of that is, is relevant. So anyway. No, it's, it's, it's simply a discussion. Of, it's, it's a discussion of truth and that, like I've explained this to you on the phone the other night. I've had a lot of National Party members get in touch. Mick, you must know what's going on. Please explain to me which side I should take. I've had that consistently since this whole thing broke. I've had people leave the National yeah. Party and get in touch, complaining about Mr. Conroy. I've had people telling me to shut up and not talk about it. But I never want to listen to the crowd. So I looked at the facts of this. And what I saw was, first thing I done was I went onto the Electoral Commission's website. I said, oh, Justin's name is still there. And I said this to some trusted friends. I said, lads, he's still the leader of that party. This is all fucking fake. This, isn't, this is a clown show. It's pantomime. And this, to me, mm-hmm. is a symptom of politics in Ireland overall. There has to be a choice made between the people who are going to vote for you, to, uh, you know, be loyal to you or be loyal to James. Do you want the same style of politics we have in Ireland at the moment where corruption rules and some bureaucrat sitting in an office in Dublin decides who... Uh, if James can lead the party, or do you want the truth and honesty and to do things the right way? If they wanted to remove Justin, they could have done it at the AGM next year or whenever it is. They could have done it the Wouldn't right way. Wouldn't even be next year, but be in a couple of months. A uh, couple of oh months. God, it's, it's, it's usually in November. But and, instead, uh, what's they would have done it a different way. And they didn't just do it... Um, like, uh, th- there's personal things that I look at here. They've done this when his wife was heavily pregnant. You know, a, a fellow who called himself his friend for 30 years. Can ye trust that man if his best friend can't trust that man? These are questions you need to ask yourself. And you need to ask why James Reynolds isn't coming onto a space and answering these questions. And however else, Paul Conroy, I will happily host them tomorrow night on this space. And they can have an hour and a half or two hours, just as Justin's after getting to tell their side of the story. And people can decide, I'm not, this is not me telling you, Trust Justin, trust James. This is me saying, here is information that has been intentionally hidden from you. Make your own decisions. Now, with that said, on to the questions. Justin, first one. (laughs) This was a common one. Did you use National Party donations to buy a car for 13,000 euros? No, I did not. No, I absolutely did not. I have never owned a vehicle. Uh, I don't think I've ever driven a vehicle that was worth 13000 or cost 13000 I I may have been in, in a, pa- a passenger in one, <laughs> I'd say, over the years. Uh, but no, I did not uh, buy a car for myself with €13,000 of National Party uh, donations. No, no, absolutely not. That story is Thin air. It is absolutely untrue. 15,000 euro of cash. It's, it's a joke. It's been a joke. It's been an ongoing joke, uh, what's called uh, online. And it's a joke that kind of mm-hmm. hits home because they do have a point. Is every so often somebody mentions the state of my car. <laughs> I have no defense. Oh, I have no defense for it except, uh, except um, five children. <laughs> <laughs> Five children, uh, what's called, to wreck the inside of it. Um, I get a drug inside of it. I don't know, but 
it was never worth uh, 13,000 and it uh, and 13,000 euro of national party donations were not uh, used to buy a car for me no absolutely not no absolutely okay. not now i'm going to i'm going to throw in a proviso there by the way since we're on the subject uh, mm -hmm. is because it, there's there's a sneaky thing being done here, uh, because Mr. Reynolds is quite a wealthy man, and, and Mr. Conroy appears not to be short of a few quid either. Is I don't have I'm not very well off. I don't have very much money. I don't make any secret of that, and the fact that I don't have it is because I have never pursued it in the way that uh, I ought to have done if I wanted to be a wealthier man. So, um. Has are there times when the leader of a party like myself, who is not that well off, uh, takes expenses, petrol expenses, for example, well, diesel specifically, uh, because he's going to national party meetings uh, and and buys things out of party funds for for political purposes, for political purposes, uh, yes. Yes, there have been, but in 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 the amounts of thirteen thousand, no, that would be ridiculous. No, not at all. But I think it's perfectly legitimate. Otherwise, we cannot have a political system in which the leader of a party can be the leader of a party unless he's a wealthy man to begin with, and that's part of the problem with Ireland's political system: is that you're expected to be wealthy before. Uh, so that um, and then you can enrich yourself a little bit more doing politics. But is it legitimate to take uh, some expenses from the donations of the members in order to ensure that the party leader is at this meeting or that meeting or the other meeting uh, where he needs to be? I believe it is. And I will stand by that without getting into deeply into the, the, the details of it. But 13,000 euro. Uh, of a car, the car specifically. No, absolutely not. And the amounts that uh, that uh, uh, have occasionally been diverted into my bank account from the National Party as recompense for expenses, um, n not probably nowhere near the amount of money I put in. Because I put in two and a half thousand, I believe, in the first year. I put in two and a half thousand of my own money in the second year. And uh, I believe I put two thousand euro of my own money in in um, 2020, I think. So that's um, that's quite a lot of my own personal cash. And that I put in before to get the party off the ground. Um I think it's perfectly legitimate that a party leader takes, you know, uh, um, to, can to, can have the the access to party funds for legitimate expenses. Now, I have a very narrow view of what constitutes legitimate expenses. Very narrow view of it. Um, but um, back to the car, specifically the car, and I could just have dealt with the car. Back to the car. No. A 13,000 euro car was never bought for me by anybody ever at any time. Not by myself, not by the National Party, not by my mammy, not by my daddy, not by, not by my, uh, what, by nobody. No, 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 no. I've never driven such a vehicle. Uh, never, never. No bother. So that's, no bother. that's the direct answer to the direct question. But as I say, I, 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 I take aside that proviso. Uh, what Scott? That it is legitimate uh, that people be recompensed for expenses to the party, and indeed, Mr. Reynolds, over the years, even though he is a wealthy man, has occasionally uh, taken expenses, um, uh, genuine, legitimate expenses uh, mm -hmm. that he incurred because of his deputy leadership of the party, and would not otherwise have incurred, and. I don't have, I'm, I'm not going to list them out here either because I think they're all very legitimate. And the other thing, the other thing, when, when, when we're here um, talking about money, 
specifically or 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 the suggestion of lining pockets or 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 having a, a like extravagant lifestyles or whatever sipo uh, there's a, there's this story that the media have put out uh, that we do not uh, send our accounts to sipo and we've never sent accounts to sipo no we don't we don't send public auditor assigned accounts to sipo we don't. We don't do that because that is far too much information for SIPO to have and to publish on their website, as far as I'm concerned. Because I go every year to the SIPO's website and I read the accounts of the other political parties. And I can tell a hell of a lot about those political parties and the state they're in from their accounts. I can tell how dependent, for example, in particular, people before profit are on state money and the fact that they, that party could not function at this point if it was dependent on membership donations or membership fees. It just couldn't function. It's, it is entirely addicted to state money at this point. These, uh, these communists, these Marxists, these revolutionaries uh, are in receipt of circa one million a year in state money. And you look at their accounts and have a look and see how much comes in from the party membership. And you realize that if they drop below 2% or if they were like ourselves to be deregistered by the Electoral Commission and were no longer to be in receipt of that state cash, they have no resource base. They, They have been addicted to state money now for years and years and years at least at least a decade so let me but on the other hand on on the other hand what we do have to send them are it's a criminal offense what we do have to send them is the bank account statements the bank account statements every penny that is spent and every penny that is received now you'd have it's a hell of a lot to go through an entire year's bank statements by a political party uh, uh, in order to find out information. But they have all the information in terms of raw data. They don't have it in the form of accounts every year, but they have it in raw data. They have the bank account statements. So every penny that's spent and and what it was spent on and every penny that is received and who it was received from is sent to the Standard and Public Office Commission every year. And I hate doing it, but I have no choice because I am legally mm-hmm. obliged to do it. Uh, but I, I, they can't force me to, uh, to get a public auditor, which would cost us about four grand a year as well, to get him to sign the bottom mm-hmm. of an account. Um, because I'm not putting it together. For, for, the, for the enemy. I'm not putting it together for PPB and I'm not putting it together for uh, Fianna Fáil or anybody else. Let Sipo and, and the Gardaí go through our accounts. But I will say this, in the seven years that the party has been in existence, Sipo has not once, and, and they're, they're very clear about this, the only money that you are allowed to spend is from the party account is for political purposes. This is very clear in the legislation so for political purposes. And SIPO has never once questioned any spending by the National Party in the last seven years and suggested that it was spent on anything other than political purposes. Mm-hmm. Nor have they uh, what's called questioned any of the donations that we have received, except once. There was a backup of, um, uh, you know, uh, donations that are, are go through PayPal. And mm. they, there was a backlog of them. And there was a little bit to sort about, out about identification. This is around 2019, I think. And, uh, and suddenly a lot of money came in at once, as it were, because they finally verified our ID and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And three and a half thousand came in all at once. And of course, that exceeds the two and a half thousand that any, a political party can receive from any one individual. And they queried that. 
and it was explained to them that that was not from one individual. That was, in fact, that was held on to by PayPal for the past two months or so. Uh, and uh, and was did, and when we finally sorted out ID issues with them, et cetera, et cetera, they, they lodged the money into the party account all at once. And that's why there's one lodgement. But it's one lodgement from, from many people, shall we say. And they've right. had a look at that and they went, yeah, that's fine. Not once have they ever queried that any payments to the party uh, uh, are, are, are in any way not in order. And they have the bank statements, every penny in and every penny out. They don't have... What, uh, they don't have the accounts, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I have an accountancy background myself. They don't have official accounts that have headings like membership fees, you know, X amount or um, state funding, X amount or, um, you know, donations, X amount. They don't have, they have, but they have every single individual payment, every single one that has come in okay. or gone out of the party since the day we were registered as a third party. Now that goes back to uh, late 2016, early 2017. I think it was late 20. No we, we had registered as a third party almost immediately. And from that time onwards, SIPO has received our bank accounts. Could you imagine the amount of detail that I could tell about you or you could tell about me if you had my actual bank statement? Mm. Mm. And these people just think there was just, fraud going I'm on. just conscious of time, Justin, so I'm just going to get to a few more fine, questions. Fine. Because I know the lads have a I couple of I just thought it was the worst accusation. I just thought it was the worst accusation and worth, worth spending time on, shall we say. The idea right. that I would ever take advantage of the donations from National Party members for my own personal benefit is absolutely a despicable accusation. And again, it, it's, it's a legitimate one if it were true. It's legitimate if it were true, but it's not. And Mr. Reynolds knows it's not. He, th- yeah. he knows it's not. And, uh, and it's, cr- it's quite despicable of him. But it's in, it's, it's in the public interest that they'd be answered. Absolutely. And in full yeah. detail. Yeah. And, no bother. Thanks. and thanks for answering. Honestly, I appreciate that. Um, here's one you might not like, but I'm sure you'll like the opportunity to talk about it. So... A number of questions came in. Why did he quote Mein Kampf after the event where you were attacked up north? Why did you quote Mein Kampf was the question. Now, I'm just going to put it to you like that and let you answer it however you like. Yeah, there's a, there's, a, there's a very simple answer to that. Is There was a rush in the party among some people who got very nervous after the Ardesh, and they have expressed that since. And you've heard it in the broadcast the other night. Uh, what was wrong with the quote, quoting Mein Kampf, uh, what it did, what its effects were, is it, they were in the intended effects. <laughs> they were the intended effects. There was a rush in the party's head by some people that we need to rush back to the centre, that we've gone too far out on the right, that we're on our own out here, that we can be like viciously attacked by communists and nobody gives a damn. And gripped, suddenly, John McGurk, John McGurk's on our side. Oh, oh, hooray, we're so excited. Oh, God, John McGurk likes us. Uh, What's it called? Uh, Herman Kelly says something nice about us. Um, Other people who have said nasty things about us in the past, they start saying nice things about us. Uh, We need to move to the the centre. We need to get more of this sympathy. Sympathy is the exact phrase I think Mr. Reynolds used. Sympathy. We need to get more sympathy from people. And uh, we need to use this story of being attacked by the communists to gain sympathy. There was a rush back to the centre, as far as I could see, politically and ideologically. I set off an explosion. That's what I did. I set off an explosion on purpose. I burnt the bridges back to the centre because I didn't think I was removable as party leader, so I hadn't considered a coup. I burnt the bridges back to the centre, exactly as Mr. Rell said. It's one of the very few things that he said the other night that is true, although he didn't realise why I was doing it at the time, and he still doesn't seem to fully understand it. But that's why I did it. Is I said, ah, what's God? Now there'll be no more nice articles about the National Party and Grip. 
<laughs> and there'd be no more nice uh, things said about it in the media because we don't need it and we don't want it. And, uh, and we, we need to stand by our principles. Uh, and we need to not become a populist party which appeals to people on the basis of their lowest and basest instincts. We need to appeal to them on their higher instincts and on their higher, uh, on a higher level. At this stage, at least, as we build the base of the party. And there was this fear in the aftermath of the Ardesh that uh, that we were out on our own, and we are, and we are, and we were, and uh, but we could make all these new friends, uh, and in particular among conservatives. And this came up again during the pro life rally when I asked about uh, that we we have our banners and we have our flags at it and whatever. The main reason for objecting to that by Mr. Codmore was uh, we're making friends in conservatives conservative circles conservative circles and we will alienate them if we are too brash and we are too bold and we are too out there as who we are and what we believe in so why did i why did i send out that quote uh what's got yeah i i set off a bomb that blew up the bridge back to the center simple as that <laughs> simple as that once you cut awesome. as i said uh, my own phrase is, once you've quoted Adolf Hitler, there is really no going back from that. You know, and I knew that. Well, there's one way of going back, of course, is that you dump the party leader. But you're, <laughs> you're not going be- you're, you're to get invited. You're not going to get invited to a dinner party at John McGurk's uh, watch pot, where you can sit with Catherine Noon, who introduced abortion into Ireland, and maybe she'll put her arm around you as well as John McGurk. You know, that's not going to happen to you now, right? You're off, the, you're off the grit Christmas card list. I'm definitely off the grit. Uh, and so, is, so I thought was the party. And uh, that's what I wanted to do. And that's why I did it. Very, very simple. End this, de- end well. this idiot debate. End this idiot debate about whether we should move to the centre or whether we should make friends with conservatives or whether we should be like soften the party's line by doing something that that burnt a bridge. There's no going back. There's no. It's crossing the Rubicon. There's no going back to the centre. You can only go forward, and that is this party slogan. I ask your eye forward to the right. Mm-hmm. Uh, the the quote itself. Find something in that quote that's objectionable. I know you say well, you object to the, or maybe you wouldn't, but um, the people out there well, uh, uh, say, personally, I object to who said I can't. it. <laughs> uh, uh, I, per, I object to who said it, right? Maybe you do. Uh, but, you, uh, but who is there out there who objects to what was actually said? The statement itself, in and of itself. And mm. ask yourself, why is it that if I quote, uh, as I do, as I do, uh, what's called um, Lenin or Trotsky or Stalin or anybody else on the left, that there is no hubbub, that there is no scandal, there is no fuss. John McGurk doesn't. <laughs> John McGurk doesn't get upset. Nobody gets upset. Uh, but you can't quote Adolf Hitler, no matter what it is, and even if the statement itself is perfectly benign. And even if the statement is something that everybody agrees with, or most people agree with, certainly most people in the National Party would agree with the words used, there is a problem with it because of who it was that said it. If there's a problem with an idea because of who had it, as opposed to the idea itself, there's something deeply wrong with the way you view politics and political ideology. And that's another thing I would say to people is I think that Adolf Hitler is as quotable as anybody else. Positively, negatively, whatever way you want. He's a, he's a significant figure of the 20th century history. And he said things, some of them, uh, what caught were correct, some of them were not. But I knew, and I knew, and I did it deliberately, is I knew you can't do this and tack back to the center. 
in Irish politics afterwards. And you get taken off, as you use, as you use the phrase, you get taken off the gripped uh, uh, Christmas card list. You definitely do. And you don't get hugs from Catherine Noon. No chance after that. Uh, because of who it is. Not because of what he said, well, but because of who he is. Don't worry so too much about that now. Don't worry too much about that. We're all off the grip, the, the gripped Christmas card list after uh, after the, the the protest a couple of weeks ago. They turned on everyone, but sure, we all knew who gripped Indeed. that from the start. Well, another yeah, another well, day's we, conversation. Uh, our people didn't. Our people didn't. So, or some of our people didn't. Mr. Reynolds is there last Thursday night talking about how, how I lost our, our friendship, our new friendship with John McGar. <laughs> He's still talking about it. He's still upset. <laughs> Months later, it keeps him awake at night that John McGurk doesn't like him. So, so you say, oh, well, you know it, and people out there know it, and we all can see what grip is. Yeah, I can see it, and you can see it, but Paul Conroy apparently can't see it, and certainly James Reynolds can't see it. And, they, and the rest of the people, as they say, the public faces that they lined up, uh, that are the leadership of the National Party, all of them can't see it because they all want to be John McGurk's friend. They all sat there while James said, we need to make friends with John McGurk and everybody clapped. That's your answer as to where, uh, do, does everybody get it? Does everybody get it? No, they don't. No, they, no, don't. they don't. A lot of people get it. A lot of people get it. And a lot more people get it than, say, three years ago. But mm-hmm. a lot of people still don't get it. And some of those are, are, uh, are some of them are claiming to be very senior in the National Party. Now, uh, the fact of the matter is, if I get the leadership uh, given back to me, given back to me, given to me, but given back to me by the Electoral Commission, I tell you, they won't be faces of the National Party for very much longer. The people who want to hug Catherine Noon and Tom McGuck and uh, uh, at, at, at soirees <laughs> in Dublin 4. No, it's not happening. It's not happening. Not under my leadership. And if they want my resignation, if the whole bloody party wants my resignation, then I would give it to them at an AGM because they object to what I do or what I say. But what I will not back down to is this miserable nasty, personalised coup by people who got frightened because of what happened at the audition. God knows it was frightening. God knows it was frightening. And it was, but it was more frightening for some of the people who were at the very front line of it. And, uh, and many of those people are with me. Many of those people were me, the, mo- the most injured person there. And again, I don't dox people, so I'm not about to give you his name. The most injured person on the day. There were two people hospitalized. Um, the most injured person on the day is on my side. The other person who was hospitalized is on my side. Now, there's a, there, there are people who are afraid. Right, I get it. They have reason to be afraid. It is. It was it was scary. It was a scary situation. These people came and they wanted to kill us. They wanted to kill people. And they were like, you don't, they brought claw hammers, for God's sake. They wanted to kill people. This was not to hurt people. You bring sticks. As I say, you bring sticks to hurt people. You bring claw hammers to kill people. And most specifically, I don't doubt they wanted to kill me. And if they had got past that door, and got into the main conference room and access to the women and children that were there, uh, that would not have bothered them either to swing hammers in all directions. So was it scary? Yes, it was. Is this the fight we're in? Oh, I'm afraid it is. Like, uh, I'm afraid it is, lovies, out there, you know? The nature of the beast at the moment. We're dealing with radicals on the other side. if, If you don't, if you're not up for it, if you're not up for it, you're not up for it, fine. Mm-hmm. That's fine. But it, it is that bad. It is that bad. We have people out there who are, who are willing to kill in order to further the Marxist agenda in this country. Mm-hmm. And they are willing to turn up on bus loads with claw hammers to do it. Yeah. And if you don't have the guts for it, fine, run. But don't run to the Electoral Commission to try and grab the National Party. 
Just run home. Run home to your mammy because that's where you belong. <laughs> now, Justin, I'm going, to throw, I'm going to throw it up north to Toby. I don't think you've met Toby before. He's the co-host here in the space. And uh, I think he has a question. And then after that, I'm going to give Keto a question there as well. So uh, take it away, Toby. Words. <laughs> the proper key. Yeah, <laughs> well, Dawson, that's oh, the first time I really did. I heard you speak and uh, you made a few points. So there's one or two things I want to touch on. So with this electoral commission issues, we'll put it that way. Are the NP, say they hold this over your head for as long as they can. We know the government can take ages. Can the NP run any candidates when this is hanging over their heads? Um, not really, not really, because uh, what the law says is that, or or else we could be in a bizarre situation. What what the what the actual law says is that the election uh, documentation for a candidate of the national party can be signed by either Mister Reynolds or myself. That is the current situation on on the electoral commission's website. So, uh, you could you. It's conceivable. Now you'd have to talk to a solicitor about this, or even a barrister about this. But it's conceivable that a candidate uh, that uh, ran for, say, the local elections next year, who had a a a document signed by myself, would be accepted as a national party candidate. And in the same constituency, in the same ward, uh, somebody who had a document signed by Mr. Reynolds would also be accepted as a National Party candidate. That's how that these are. This is the bizarre legal world we are in while this is up in the air, because until the Electoral Commission decide the current status is and of course the current status wasn't the problem where myself and James were in total agreement on who those candidates would be or who uh, we would the party would support in any given situation but either one of us are legally entitled to to sign the nomination papers for somebody to run on behalf of the national party next June and if the electoral commission has not come down on this on one side or the other. I imagine the legal situation is is that I can nominate candidates for the National Party and so can James. That that would be insane, but I believe that is probably the current situation if they don't decide it before uh, next June. And they could run it on and on and on and on. And who knows how long they could run it on. I am. I, I am hoping that it won't go. It won't come to that. Now, obviously, I'm hoping it won't come to that. Obviously, I'm hoping that they will decide before then, and I believe they will decide before then because if they're going to make a corrupt decision, they will go. They're going to want to make a corrupt decision before the local and European elections, so that the national party puts forward the kind of candidates and the kind of people that they want, uh, either to fail to get elected or the wrong people elected. Uh, they're not going to want. Um, they're not going to want uh, to give the, the party to me. But then again, legally, do they have any choice but to give it to me? Um, I know, you know. So that's the status at the moment. Is that I can sign the nomination papers of a national party candidate in a local Doyle or European election, and so can James Reynolds. And both of those papers at this moment uh, would be valid, is my understanding. Yeah, yeah. thank you for that. Matthews. The next thing I wanted to say was, listening here and hearing both sides, I was never in the MP, never had much to do with the MP. But looking as an outside observer, it looks to me that like the tactics that were used by Reynolds and Conroy, not just to take the party, but then after the party was taken... Remind me of tactics that we would all people we would all consider would be our enemies. So, yeah, even if they did get the party, I don't see how anybody could trust them men to run that party. Is my point? Well, I go, for, I, I, I go, I go further than that because that's that's very straightforward. You absolutely can't trust them. Uh, 
you absolutely cannot trust them at all in a position of any authority whatsoever. That's why I removed Mr. Reynolds uh, from the party and from the National Directorate. But I would say this to the people sitting around Mr. Reynolds uh, at the table uh, of that speech the other night, to think to themselves, what does James know about me? <laughs> what does James know about me? Because if he will tell such a personal story from so very long ago about somebody he knows for 30 years, if he ever gets it into his head that he doesn't like me, if he gets it into his head he doesn't like Jerry Knievy, for example, if he gets it into his head that he doesn't like uh, uh, Paddy Quinlan, for, for, uh, for example, if he gets it into his head that he doesn't like Keith Woods anymore, for example, <laughs> if he gets it into his head, they better ask themselves, what does he know? What does he know? Because he will broadcast it. He won't just tell people. He won't just whisper it or gossip it. He will broadcast it to the entire world. So, be careful what James Reynolds knows about you. That's what I would say. And be careful what Paul Conroy knows about you. Never mind trusting them to lead a national political party. Be careful what they know about you or your life uh, uh, or any personal details of it because there is no depths to which they will not stoop in order to bring you down and humiliate you if that's what they decide to do. Very bad situation for anybody. I say, I say, I say, I say to people, if, if, the, if they end up with the party run like hell. And yeah, well, God, I, I, you, that would be you, something that me and you would agree on there, that if somebody does something so obvious and so out in the open, they're never to be trusted again. And the last question before you go, in the North, we're having a lot of talk now about Brexit and they're talking about maybe running a border poll in 2030 for a United Ireland. If Sinn Féin got to that point and it was Sinn Féin that were doing the border poll, would you support them? If you were the leader of the NPD? Uh, I'll, be, I'll be very straightforward on that one. I would have to look at the exact wording of what the border poll was. Right? And uh, what I yeah. mean by that is... Uh, there is unlikely to be a straightforward question like, do you want Irish unity? It's going to be like the Good Friday Agreement. There's going to yeah. be detail. But if the principle of Irish unity of the 32-county republic is put to a vote by Sinn Féin and it's written properly, and it's there's no there's nothing dodgy about it. I don't care if Mary Lou Macdonald is the one who wrote it. I really don't. I'll vote for it. I'll vote I for it. Any, any party, there, but... that, any party. Sorry, that I agree I, um, with your statements there, but I don't influence. think I could support anything that Sinn Féin puts forward. That they're just they're not to be trusted, and I don't think that. Well, that's it'll be very that's sneaky and underhand. Question. Whatever they do, you know that's what Marxists exactly. do. It'll be a very detailed document, uh, what's got, that'll be that we'll have to answer yes, no to. And I imagine it will not be straightforward and that we will be voting in ourselves into an agreement a little bit like the Good Friday Agreement. For example, I voted against the Good Friday Agreement. Now, I did not vote against the Good Friday Agreement because I didn't want the war in the North to end. I voted against Good Friday Agreement because I believed then and I believe now <laughs> definitely is the Good Friday Agreement would not work and it has not worked. But that was a very minority opinion at the time. Now, I will look, I will look, members of any organization that I'm involved in with, uh, will look at a proposal for a united Ireland in the detail of it. But on the principle itself, uh, just because it was Mary Lou Macdonald that proposed it, if the, if, the, if the principle itself was sound, but I don't trust Sinn Féin and I don't suggest to anybody to trust Sinn Féin. And I think the breakthrough in Irish politics will come in the South and in the North as well, uh, but, to, but more so in the South, when the great 
promise, that vague promise that Sinn Féin makes of change is seen to be as hollow as it actually is. And the devil is in the detail. So if you ask me, would I vote for Irish unity in the morning? Yes, absolutely, I would. Would I vote for uh, would Would I object to voting for Irish unity because Mary Lou Macdonald was the Taoiseach at the time that it happened? No, of course I wouldn't. I would still support a united Ireland, but there will be a complex agreement that will be put to us, and the likelihood is that there will be parts of that agreement which cannot be stomached by a decent Irish Republican uh, because there's, there's parts of, of Sinn Féin, the party, uh, a lot of Sinn Féin, the party, that cannot be stomached by any decent nationalist Irish Republican. And I don't know how there... I assume and I hope there are still some in Sinn Féin so as the so as there's still some to leave Sinn Féin, but I don't know how there are. I don't know how you can watch yeah. what they have done over the past decade, decade and a half or more, and say I'm a proud Irish nationalist Republican and I support this party. Don't know how you can do it. Don't know how anybody can. I don't, I'm not accusing you of doing it, but I don't know how anybody can do it. Don't know. Oh, here. I really then, don't understand. I used to I used to be on board on the train and then I woke up over COVID and stuff and then I started to look back and take a step back and look past what they paint themselves to be and then I, as I stepped back yeah. further and further I was like holy fuck these people are up to no good it's going to be a, you know yeah. what, it's going to be a United Ireland that they push and it'll be a United Ireland in Europe you know it'll not be a sovereign oh, it'll definitely be that. state yeah, so it'll I don't want that. If it that. isn't but sovereign and Irish, I don't want it. But there'll be stuff in it as well, I would suggest, that it will be uh, what's got that we, we will be told is in order to uh, appease unionist opinion or Protestant opinion in Northern Ireland. And in fact, it will be to appease uh, Marxist opinion. Uh, and in other words, we'll be told, oh, the only way we can have peace and unity is if we give up this and we give up that and we give up the other. We give up the national anthem, we give up the tricolor, we give up the, you know, these are symbols, but they're important symbols. The tricolor flew over the GPO in 1916. And, you know, people get into arguments about, oh, it had Freemasonic origins in the French Revolution, yakety yak, yak, yak. Right. Fact of the matter is, is that good, decent Irishmen died under that flag. And that flag is stained with the blood of patriots. And I am not willing to hand it over beyond the, on the, the, the statement that, uh, it, oh, we need to do this in order to make the unionists happy in United Ireland. But what it actually is, is to get rid of all trace of Irish nationalism, real Irish nationalism. I tell you, in front of my house right now, the tricolour is flying from a pole. Uh, what has got a, a great deal taller than me, and it doesn't take much to be taller than me. But um, as as the as the leftists like to point out, and now that Mr Reynolds supporters are uh, to point out how I'm not a very tall individual. Well, whoop the fucking do, really. Seriously, I'm not that's, tall. Hey, hey that's, just that's on where, the question. Justin, that's why they brought in Keith Woods. That's why they brought in Keith Woods. <laughs> he's already tall. He's actually tall. <laughs> he makes up for you. <laughs> that, if the, uh, if the state changes the flag in order to appease anybody. That tricolor in my yard will still fly every day until the day I die or until the day I can't, I haven't the strength to lift it. Simple as that. Simple as that. That alone would be enough. You know, change your tricolor. I'm, I'm gone. I'm gone. I'm not voting for that. I, not voting for it. Yeah, I don't think we'll yeah, even I'll get that far. Yeah. I think a lot of Irish people are starting to wake up now to what Sinn Féin are doing. They do need to get into power so everybody that isn't paying attention, all these people paying half attention, and then when it gets really bad, everybody's going to realise, oh, you were never on our side. And that's when I think there'll be a big turnaround. There's a rise in nationalism. 
across Europe and America, even in Canada and stuff. I think that flag will be flying over this country for the next centuries. We'll just say it that. That's what I believe anyway. Uh, Keith, yeah. though, was there any questions yeah. there you want to ask? We might have got Keith on the bench there, did we? Is there anyone else there listening that wants to put a hand up and ask Justin a quick question before he goes? I'm conscious of the time. He's given us a couple of hours here now. So is there anyone else not there? If not, I, we'll I, wrap it I, I, I want to be, I want to, I want to uh, above all be done with this tonight because as I said, there's a very good chance that there will be another statement tomorrow with another list <laughs> of accusations. And uh, what, Did we lose him? Seems so. He might, might reject there. He's, he's had some bad signal. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, look, anyone there listening now, lads, this is your chance. He's been transparent. It's live. You can ask him questions. As long as you're not a fucking head the ball, I'll bring you up. Yeah. <laughs> you know, this is the place. This is the time. So to let there not be any more speculation and rumours or see, like this is... You have an opportunity now here. But um, yeah, he's been fairly transparent. Like he's asked, he's answered everything. I had about 20 questions for him, but he answered them all in his, in his big speech. So he kind of covered them all. But, yeah, uh, same here. I was, writing down, I was writing down questions as he was going. And then he's like, oh, now he's touched on that subject. So there was just a few things that I had down there before. I just wanted to mm -hmm. ask to see what the MP is all about. Away from all this sort of drama and stuff. So about that. <laughs> yeah, back there, Justin. A big thing for a lot of people. You there, Justin? Can you hear us? Yeah, just Rebecca entered the room with the baby and I got distracted for a moment. Sorry, I didn't hear the question. No, you're grand, you're grand. Uh, Keto, are you there? Do you want to ask Justin a question? You've been waiting there a while. No, no sign of Keto. No. Justin, I'll throw it to you so to, to wrap it up. Is If there's anything else you want to say, this um, we've had about three hundred people listening live, and this will be left up on my Twitter as the pinned tweet. So it'll be there for. I'm sure we'll have media and guards and everyone listening to this. And um, I'm sure James is going to broadcast this at the next national park you meet. I'm sure he wants everyone to hear us. <laughs> oh, but, uh, if there's anything you want to say, absolutely. wrap it up. Take the floor. Well, um, as I say. Uh, no, I don't think there is a hell of a lot. I mean, I like I have gone through uh, the the scenario, the internal split in the party, uh, in so far as there is one, is between people who want to move to the back to the centre, um, want to create a conservative party, and above all else, want to uh, sell out the principles of the party in order to gain votes. Um, if I'm, for example, if I'm such a defective character, the nine principles of the National Party, are they going to keep them? Because I know I plagiarized Article 1 of de Valera's Constitution for Article 1 or for principle number one of the National Party. But every word, other word, line and comma uh, of the nine principles is written by me personally. Now, if I am of such a defective character, surely they have to get rid of those principles. Are they going to? Or are they saying that, you know, even though he was mad and he was crazy and he was a lunatic, we absolutely still believe absolutely 100% in the nine principles that he wrote down for us and said could never be changed. I don't know. I don't know. Those nine principles will never change under my leadership. And I, but I don't understand how they can remain under the leadership of a man who says I am of a defective character and personality uh, so that split that exists I don't think it's very big in numbers by the way but it's significant in who the individuals are that split between those who are of the right like myself and I did a telegram post the other day of what I mean by being of the right and those who want to tack back to the centre and make friends with conservatives who are afraid of labels, like racist or whatever. Uh, what's got James, for example, the other night again, one of the things he said was that I repeatedly said I was a fascist. I did not say I was a fascist. 
And what I said was, is I don't care if people call me a fascist. And that was not edited out. So that was especially stupid of him to say it had to be edited out. Because it wasn't edited out. <laughs> that went up on YouTube uh, where I said, I do not care. Uh, I am called and I made out a list of the transphobe, homophobe, all the phobes. <laughs> Uh, and uh, and threw in fascist Nazi and everything, all the others. And, and, and I said, I'm accused of being all of these things. And I said, uh, do, and they want me on every single program I go on, uh, if I am allowed on a program at all, to deny each one of them. And I said, I will not deny them uh, because they can accuse me of whatever they want. I don't care. That's what I said. I didn't say I was a fascist. I didn't say I was a fascist, because I don't, now, I, I, I would be getting very esoteric if I was to get into why I'm not. It, it wouldn't be an uh, uh, anti-faz um, definition. But I've read fascist booklets I, I, in, in, in great detail, and uh, what's called, and I know what the ideology is in great detail, and I don't agree with it. Right, so that's as simple as that. So I don't want to come across like Keith Woods in there, but I, let's, have, let's have a to our discussion on Nietzsche and the difference between Nietzsche and Mussolini. But I, uh, but if you're going to call me a fascist, I don't care. I don't care. I'm not going to spend an hour arguing with you about it. Um, if you're going to call me a Nazi, I, know, I, I don't care. I don't care. If you're going to call me a homophobe, I don't care. I don't care. If you're going to call me a transphobe, I don't care. I don't care. Uh, let's get back to what I was actually talking about. Uh, for example, uh, what's called transsexual, uh, or, you know, uh, uh, the transsexual agenda is disgusting. The, uh, the homosexual paedophile agenda is disgusting. Uh, you can say homophobe, transphobe. Okay, grand, fine. I'm not dead. Let's get back to the issue. Let's get back to the issue. On the issue of mass immigration, I don't want any more mass in immigration into this country. I don't want it from the Ukraine and I don't want it from Africa. Are you a racist? I don't care if it's racist to, to, to say that. I actually don't care. Let's get back to the issue. I do not want mass immigration of non-Irish people into this country to change the very nature of a culture and the ethnicity of the Irish people. I don't care if there are white people from the Ukraine or black people from Somalia. That I don't care about. What I care about is whether they're Irish or not. And if we need immigrants into this country, if we do, then they should come from the diaspora. They should be our own people that we bring home. And if that's racist, then I don't care. I'll stand by the word racist. And I'll stand by any of the negative words that they want to throw. As long as I can keep the focus on the real issue that's being discussed at the time. Mass immigration, I'm opposed to. The homosexual uh, paedophile agenda, I am opposed to it. The transsexual agenda, I am opposed to it. The usurpation of the sovereign rights of the Irish people to their own nation, I'm opposed to it. The resurrection of Gaelic Ireland. I'm for it. Is that racist? I don't care. Is that fascist? I don't care if you, if you say it is. Uh, is it Nazi? If you, if you say it is, it is. I don't care. I, I'm not going to argue with you. I want a Gaelic Ireland. So I want an Ireland that uh, is specifically the national idea that, that, uh, that we started off with in 2016 in the National Party was Pierce's own words, is an Ireland not free merely, but Gaelic as well, not Gaelic merely, but free as well. And if that's transphobic, homophobic, fascist, Nazi, whatever it is, uh, I'm still for it. <laughs> I'm still for it. And you can label it whatever way you like. I'm for an Ireland not free merely, but Gaelic as well, not Gaelic merely, but free as well. And I always will be. And I will. That, that is something that I don't care how many people come at me with how many hammers. I will always be for that. And I will always stand for that. And that takes me out onto the far right, apparently now, way, way out in the far right. God help us. If that's where I am, that's where I am. That's where I'll stand. That's where I'll die. 
I'm grand with it. <laughs> I really am. I really am. I'm grand with it. Justin, I have a few people there who've come in to ask questions if you're still willing to take a couple before yeah. you go. Yeah, no problem. Truck driver. Truck driver, walk away there. Unmute your mic. Thanks, Chopper. Um, I, I've, I've the utmost for, of respect for you, man, for um, bearing your soul there in terms of absolutely... Okay, I'm not hearing going anything. ...going on part of yourself and the whole lot, right? I, I just I just have one question. I'm I'm not questioning competency or your or your vision or anything. Like that, but I'm... Sorry, just one second. Can you hear? Just one second, truck driver. You no, can't I hear. Can't, I can't hear. No, I can't. Okay. Oh, truck sorry, driver, sorry. Just, just drop out and come back in. Uh, there might be just some technical shite that's causing it. Yeah. Um, drop it. I'll bring you straight back up anyway. Hundred percent, man. Bring up somebody else there in the meantime. Thanks. No problem. Gav, do you want to work away? And um, Justin, let me know if you can hear Gav. How are you, Justin? Can you hear me? Um, let, let him let him ask the question, and I'll I'll see. Can you hear me now, Justin? Is he no, able to hear? Yeah, Gavin, uh, do you want to ask us the question, and then we can repeat it? Yeah. yeah. All, all, all I wanted to ask was. First of all, I thought it was great what he said about the flag and how important the Irish flag is because I feel the same way about that flag. I don't want that flag to ever change. I love the Troy colour and I'm proud of it and I love it. But the question I wanted to ask him is, is his family okay? And this ordeal that's been going on, I don't think stuff like this should be broadcast by anybody or people when they have grievances should talk to each other off knowing and I hope that his family's okay and is his family okay and what impact that has it had on them okay did you hear any of that Justin I heard not a, not a single sound for the past maybe a minute or so right okay I'll just relay what Gavin said so he um okay. he commended he commended you there for speaking and um, he repeated the love of the tricolor and then he asked he wants to know, uh, with everything that's been going on, is your family okay? He understands that this would be a lot of stress. He has five kids himself, so he just wants to know, is everyone all right? They are, they are. They're, they're, uh, they're, um, they're, they're grand. Uh, they're my rock. They're, they're saving me, I'm afraid now, me, not me saving them. Um, they are, uh, the kids are shielded from most of it, obviously, because they don't, they don't really understand. What they do, what, what, what they do know is that uh, dad's friend, James, uh, like betrayed him. And they have difficulty understanding that and uh, what's got, and, and we can't get into it too much with them. But, um, but as a family, we're, so, we're solid. We're solid. We have a new baby and we have the, that's, that creates its own problems, but it creates its own joys as well. Look, we're grand. The Barretts, the Barretts are rock solid. Um, what's called, and I appreciate that uh, that the question is phrased in that way that shows some some human concern for us. I do I do really appreciate that because sometimes people forget that there's a human being behind a, a political persona as well, and uh, and and other human beings. And the but the Barrett family we're we're great. We're uh, what's called we're doing we're doing just fine and uh, we love each other and we mind each other and we will continue to do that and we will continue the struggle as well in whatever way we have to. Because it's their future. It's their future. My kids have to grow up in this. I I'm 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 old enough now that I could still conceivably die in a, a country that was at least ethnically more than 50% Irish. I could I could do that. Uh, what's God? Without, without too much bother. But my kids won't if this continues. No chance. They have no chance. So, um, so it's, we're grand. We're grand. Uh, and I'm doing, I'm going to fight on it. I'm going to fight. I'm fighting on for them. And they know that. I think they know that. Uh, certainly, Rebecca knows that, and uh, and she's a just a wonderful woman. And um, I'm blessed to have met her, and for her to be willing to share her life with me. I just can't, you know. It's just great. Um, yeah, that's all I can say about family. Family is just great. When family works, family is just great. 
if family is working, uh, everything is working in, in your life. Family's not working, it doesn't matter. I mean, all the money in the world and all the political power and all the rest of it, it's all a mess. But if family's working and um, and if family's okay, we're under we're under pressure. I'm under pressure. Yeah, grad. We'll, we we we're fine though. We're fine, and I appreciate uh, I appreciate the thought. I really, really, really do. On behalf of myself and all of my family, I want to say to Gavin that I really do appreciate that there are people out there who who actually care about us as human beings as well as shall we say political personalities or political representatives. And I I thank him for that very much, very much. No. No problem. Gav, did you hear that answer? You did? I did. I did. And yeah, like, uh, yeah, no, because something like that would have an impact on, on any family. And just so Justin knows, as you know, it's it's when you let someone close, people close into your life like that, you expect people to keep personal grievances and stuff away from mm-hmm. political life. It doesn't help nationalism and it doesn't help what we're trying to achieve. Not, we all might not agree with each other and we might not all be on the exact same team, but we all want the exact same thing. And we want Irish people to be put forced in the country and to be looked after forced. And, you know, everybody has their own ways of doing things and they're entitled to do it that way. But it's a time for people to be all... It's When, when people hear grievances that are going against each other, and it's just giving the left stuff to look at and it should be done off air and offline. When you have a yeah. problem with someone, you give them a ring and have a talk about it. You don't put our personal family issues all over the internet for all the world to see. It's it's that's well, that's my personal opinion, but um yeah. thanks for the response and it's been a great show to me. No problem. Thanks, Gav. Justin Gav just just said there that like, you know, his his point was that the personal should have been kept out of this. They shouldn't have stooped to that level. And um, you know, one thing one thing Anyone who knows Gavin Pepper is um, any way at all can can tell you about him. Is the the man runs on love? He runs on it. The love of his family, yeah. the love of his woman, and the love of his daughters. He runs on, it. and um, it's kind of intoxicating. You know, he he brings you up. He's he's one of those people. <laughs> that's that's why he's yeah. doing so well. He's somebody that's, I you know, he's somebody he's, haven't met, uh, and I I look forward to meeting him at uh, a future event. Um, I don't believe I've met him, um, but uh, I'm, I'm glad to talk to him. But he's, yeah, he's, 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 he's back on the mark there. Is uh, what's across is you, you run on, uh, um, you can't. So, as a human being, there's only, there's only, you're, you're not, you're not a tank. You know, mm-hmm. you're, you're not a tank, even if you try to be. And any time anybody tries to be, they, they, they eventually collapse. Um, yeah. So he's absolutely right. Family's number one, and um, and I, I I don't I don't ever forget that. And, and going through a bad time like this in many ways, I I know how blessed I am, and I know how blessed a lot of people out there in this movement who are taking an awful lot on the chin on behalf of the Irish people and nation and sometimes taking that from that very Irish people and nation who don't understand why they're doing it uh, are running on the strength that their families give them and uh, he would not be alone in that so I look forward to meeting him someday and um, and uh, and I'll shake his hand if he'll shake mine and um, I'm sure he will he'll shake the hand off you Truck driver, do you want to come in and try again there? We'll see if we can get a question for Justin. Yeah, thanks, guys. Um, just listen to Gavin there. I, I, look, he, he he said pretty much what I wanted to say in terms of uh, the personal stuff. Uh, Justin, you shouldn't have to go through any of that. And um, can I start with just saying a big congratulations there to yourself and Rebecca in terms of your, your little new arrival. And you sound very chirpy for a man with... Uh, a little baby in the house, so uh, but whatever you're doing, keep doing it. Um, the other side of it, I suppose, look on the political side. Um, look, you, you, you've, you're you're going through a lot. You're you're come you're coming out fighting. Um, I like that. I like what you're saying. I I I I've been thoroughly entertained with what you're talking about there with with the last while. Um, you're making sense. You're, 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 um, 
your whole understanding of where we are as a nation makes sense, I think, in terms of in terms of anybody that is listening. So my question to you is that if you got p- power back tomorrow, if you can get this mess cleared up, what's your next agenda for the NP uh, coming into the next election? Did you hear any of that, Justin? No. Oh. Once again, uh, no, total re- silence for, on this side. No, no problem, no problem. I'll relay it again. So, um, so truck driver just basically echoed what Gav was saying there with his sentiments that, um, you know, it's it's admirable the way you're handling all this. Um, he said you've been very composed tonight and he enjoyed listening to you. And the question that he had was, if you got power back tomorrow, what would what would be your plan? How would you go about things? He said he, he, he admires the way you speak about the reality of the situation in Ireland more than anyone else he's heard. And he wants to know how would you go forward if, if the reins were handed back to you tomorrow? Well, that's a difficult question because um, because it's a, it is a long and complicated answer. And uh, I don't want to give it... I don't want to answer it in a kind of... Um, throwaway fashion uh, you know uh, one of the things that uh, Mr. Reynolds was supposed to have done in the speech the other night was outlined his vision for the future of the National Party I haven't the faintest idea what it is based on what he said the other night I don't think anybody else has either I know from conversations with him that as you say he wants to tack back to the centre and be more electable and, and get the the, the um, cushy jobs uh, uh, element of being involved in politics. Uh, that's as much as I've got from him otherwise. But from the speech the other night, I could, uh, I could understand very little of what he actually was trying to get at as far as future vision is concerned. I, If I get the party back, uh, one of the, the, the first things I will do, I guess, uh, well, what, the very first thing I will do is I will properly and absolutely expel all these bastards. Right, and be blunt. Uh, I will go through the party list, and one after another, every one of these traitors is gone. The next thing I will do then is I will uh, try to organize a full party meeting where I can answer the question that he's just asked in great detail and proper detail and worked out detail as to where the party goes from here rather than giving it now a kind of after two and a half hours you know a kind of a tired answer and and maybe a a cliched answer if I was to do that we will formulate with the loyal members of the party where we go from here in terms of strategy and tactics but in terms of ideology uh, there will be no changes made to what we have been what we were in 2016 we are today and that's where we that that's where we will stay and that's the direction which we will we, we, will, we will always come from but in terms of strategy and tactics as i say I, anything i would say now would be a throwaway answer and it wouldn't really be well worked out by me um I have to consider the possibility of what I will do if I don't get the party back. In other words, will I just uh, will I will I form a new organization? Um, you know, there's there's so many questions um, that I don't want to give trite answers to. I have tried as much as possible here tonight not to give slippery answers, trite answers, quick, easy, snappy, no substance answers to questions. And I'd be afraid if I was to, 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 to get into, oh, well, what would you do with the party if you had it back in the morning? Anything I would say off the top of my head right here now would be trite. It would be cliched. It would lack complexity and it would lack the depth that I think that truck driver there is asking for and wants. He will get it uh, soon. Uh, and it won't be like the statement that will follow shortly. It will follow very soon. Um, but it no, it will surprise nobody uh, who has been in the National Party from 2016. Uh, there will be no sudden jerk in one direction or another, uh, no sudden changes in directions. In fact, quite the opposite. Um, support for my leadership of the party is support for the continuation of the principles 
as they always have been. Now, strategy and tactics and how we approach the elections and how we approach the future in general and relations with other organizations and so forth, it would be, uh, as I say, a trite and, and cliched answer that I might give at this moment and more people deserve better than for me to do that. So so I'm going to ponder that uh, in, in much more detail and I shall probably at some point deliver a broadcast uh, uh, probably about as long as this uh, one has been answering the, the, those questions, whether at a public meeting in a speech or from behind my desk in my office. Uh, and I will answer it fully and in a way that, that I hope that truck driver can support and that the members of the na- current members of the National Party will support and future members of the National Party will support and, and people in general will. But as I say, mm-hmm. if I was to answer it now, it'd be trite. It would be cl- I'd be throw- I might throw out a few cliches there and it would just be rubbish. Uh, and people deserve better than that. That's that's, no, that's, that's what enough. I would say. Yeah. That, yeah. That's fair enough. Thanks very much. Uh, next up, we have Jay, and then I'm going to throw it to Grant Torino. Jay, do you want to speak? And uh, Justin, if you can't hear it, I'll same again, I'll relay it to you. Okay. Hi, Justin. Uh, thanks for coming on. Can you hear me? Uh, Justin, can you hear me? No. no. I yeah, don't, just go I don't think you... Yeah, you just okay. work away, Jay. No, and yeah, 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 no worries. Uh, so my it. question is, uh, first, I just want to say thanks him for coming on, and I just have... I'm also like for, you know, free speech, anyone can have their whatever opinions they want, just in terms of the, uh, when he states the homosexual pedophile agenda, is that, are you, uh, why conflate you, are you saying that all gay people are pedophiles or just if you can expand a bit on that? So you're, you're asking them. Sorry, Jay, I kind of cut in now. You're asking him about his comments about the homosexual pedophile agenda. Can you expand on it? Was that right? Yeah, because it's it's like, are you saying all gay people are pedophiles? Oh, ah, okay. Like the okay. two together. Like, is because okay. it says it says homosexual pedophile agenda. So Right, okay, that? okay. Right, Justin, this is from Jay. Jay is, um, Jay is our, uh, our local gay man. Uh, we adopted him a couple of years ago, and we all love him very much. But uh, no, on, on the level, Jay is one of the most... He's one of the most genuine people I've ever met, but his question was on, the, on your comments when you said the homosexual pedophile agenda. He said, do you assume that that's all gay men um, or, you know, is, is it a, a wider thing with, with society that's been pushed? Uh, no, of course it's not. Uh, what's it called? Um, yeah, uh, of course it's not all gay men. Uh, uh, there are uh, uh, heterosexual pedophiles as well, and they're not all straight uh, men. That's not the way the world works. Uh, they are people, for that matter. The agenda that is being pushed in wider society, in particular uh, in the school curriculum, and of course you, we know about the library protests and so on and so forth, they, they'll they tell you how terrible it is these people want to burn books and whatever, but they won't tell you what the books they'd like to burn are. And they won't talk about the contents of those books. And they won't tell you why they um, want children to read them. So, you know, I mean, like the, the eldest child I have here is eight years of age. Uh, I have no intention of talking about to him in gra- graphic detail about heterosexuality. Um, you know, he, he's, he's too young. He doesn't need to know a hell of a lot. Um, so why would I teach him the gay agenda? Why are they teaching this in his schools? Why? Why? What is? What are they doing? So, no, I'm not presuming. Uh, I'm talking about... I think we just lost Justin again, did we? Jay, did you hear that answer you did? Yeah, yeah, no, I heard that. Uh, no, I, I was just... I, that's fine, it's cleared up. I just, It just came across because... Um, it was the way he was listening was homosexual pedophile agenda so yeah. and I think that was written as well on a manifesto or something it just comes across like that's what he's saying so I just wanted to clear that up no that's fine mate Thanks. that's absolutely fine no happy to have you on anytime you know that Pat Justin are you there can we can you hear us 
Uh, he might come back in again. Yeah. Uh, and I actually GT. agree with him as well. Oh, we know you do. I've seen your tweets. <laughs> <laughs> GT, welcome aboard. Uh, it's, a, it's an awful shame Justin isn't able to hear any of the questions from the floor. Uh, I'm sure, he, but he's been very much on point. I'm not going to. Uh, I wait for him to come back in, and he confirms that he can. Um, he can hear yourself, and then I'll. Um, I may pause at one question, but yeah, like while while he's while we're tuning back in, everybody uh, completely understands. Justin laid bare his soul, uh, his uh, his soul there in the personal situation. We're all abhorred by the personal attacks. I, I like I'm I'm absorbing this information. I haven't been p- paying attention to any of the chattering classes or listening to it, uh, I made my intention clear when the immediacy of it came out and I said the National Party hadn't written off by any, any means or stretch of the imagination and let's just sit back and see how things unfold. And unfolding they are. I thought uh, Justin's um, uh, interview was statesmanlike, perfectly statesmanlike and quantifiable and from the heart and really shows to people that haven't aren't aware of him. I've interviewed Justin twice, I've met him We'd, uh, we'd, we'd speak on, on and off for time uh, over the years, and we both understand what it means to espouse strong rhetoric or to break and smash sacred cows. Justin handled the, the mind camp thing, and it's a perfectly plausible and reasonable explanation for the quote and the strategy behind it of burning bridges. I thought it was a fait accompli. I thought it was a perfect execution uh, from, a, from a military standpoint. I thought it was very well played, you know. You burned the bridge behind your troops. There's no going back. We're all in, and that's the way it is. And the observation of our, our position, as truck driver asked, that Justin has a, a very firm grasp of the situation. And I think of all the resurgence in all the parties and the rhetoric, Justin still, I'm still admiring uh, uh, Justin's strong rhetoric. I've had, Michael will tell you, Chopper will tell you, I've, had my, uh, I've always had my questions and stuff a lot about strategy and tactics. Uh, and the hesitation for coming out and standing out when, when I thought and many others in the early days would thought now was the time for the National Party to uh, stand out. But there was a uh, there was an attempt to coup d'etat within the party and maybe that, that uneasiness was felt for a period of time and it strangled any clear leadership that anybody could take that there was probably uh, uh, probably tugging at the, at the, at the seams. You're back there, Justin? I think he's back there. If you want to try and ask him a question directly there, to see if he can hear you. Can you hear me, Justin? Five by five? No. No. Can you hear me, Justin? No. no. He... You have to unmute his mic. Yeah, you're muted there at the moment, Justin. We'll have to get it. We'll have to get him a person, a PA. We'll have to get him to get some, some sort of with this fat finger situation and unmuting <laughs> the mic. Go on. Have to speak to your social media manager. Toby, get this sorted out here. <laughs> I had to, it was turn it off and track. You know, Hello. We've got, Hello. Yeah, we can hear you now. Falter, Ash. Right. Okay. Uh, what's well, got? I tried to listen to some of what Rowan was saying there. Uh, on a different phone at the same time. So it's, it's mayhem here. Um, so I didn't get much of what he said. Uh, what you got? I just got the tail end of it, really. Uh, can you hear? He, can you hear Rowan speak, Justin? Can you hear just um, five five? Are we coming in? I can. I can hear him now. Yes. Absolutely. Ah, look at that! Every everybody else is sick to their stomach. How are you, Justin? <laughs> <laughs> I got. Hi, a, I got a, How are you? I got. I got a direct line. I feel like uh, President Nixon talking to the astronauts on the moon from 160,000 <laughs> miles away <laughs> over a wireless connection. Well, but anyway, I digress. Okay, we're not. We're not going to get into that. <laughs> With the moon landing flat. Out. I was just. I'm I was not, just saying. I'm not going there. You're definitely right. You're right. You're very wise. I was just saying, and uh, I'm delighted that you can hear me. I might just rehash it a little bit. I thought your interview tonight was very, uh, very statesmanlike and very well conducted. Uh, someone that's been a, a, a long time follower and, you know, yourself and yourself, we've, we've interviewed and, and conversed. I thought the, as everybody else would agree with me, that the personal attacks and the, the way things have unfolded was quite abhorrent and we are all quite taken aback from it. But you've handled it and you've exposed it and you've dealt with it as, I, I, 
uh, I would never have uh, doubted and expected. It was very statesmanlike, and your answers have been very critical, logical, and very well thought out. I was especially pleased with the analogy of the uh, the, the quotation of uh, Adolf Hitler in regards to the burning of the bridges strategy. It's a kind of a, theolo a theopolin sort of situation where the, the men went to the the 300 Spartans went out, but you kind of uh, sealed the deal by burning the bridge behind that there'll be no return uh, for a centre position. Yeah, and and the and the the, the the exposure now, the exposition again of all the... It's, it's kind of a, a cathartic situation because the as soon as a, a situation or an emergency or a peril-clutching moment comes out, such as your quotation or any other situation, is a time when those that say that they are on our side bare their teeth and turn on us and punch right Yet again, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. we were talking about grip specifically, but I don't want to take away from your interview tonight. And uh, I, again, I look forward to it. I, I'm very much appreciative of other people now getting to hear your words, the way you handle yourself. A lot of people are probably new to having to sit down and having a full hour and a half of you and to get the measure of you. I thought it was a fantastic interview. <laughs> no, well, it's fantastic. Very it's very much, well dealt with. Really very well dealt with. And I've always appreciated the work you have done for the, the national cause as well. And again, no more than Mick, we haven't always agreed. Uh, but yep. that's not that's not it. Uh, what's got, um, you've never got personal with me and I've never got personal with you. Uh, what's got, if, if we had a disagreement, we had it straight out and it was, yeah. it was a, a public or a political matter, not, not, not personalised. But the cause Stop always comes first, it? It's the, it the cause always comes first, and, and, and that's the driving motivation. So the, the financial and all the insults and the accusations, they mean nothing in the labelling. You push on through. But isn't it, uh, just, just a quick finisher, uh, for the for the realisation to where to where you and I probably started, a lot more, Michael coming in and lots of other people coming to, uh, lots of understanding as an encouraging sign to the growth in the movement of understanding of logos, logic and reasoning, the return to sovereignty. Um, the, the moral, I, I, I mean, I understand Jay's question in regards to the homosexual and the paedophile uh, uh, agenda, but we, we have to be brash and brazen. We can't expect anyone, everybody on our side to be catered for in every rhetorical examination of the, the attack that we find ourselves under. And we, we must be brave and bold as you are in all times rhetorically, and there are no sacred cows. So carry on, and carry on, Bryce Alder, carry on. Thank you very much. There's not a hell of a lot I can say to that, uh, except, uh, first of all, I agree with you, and second of all, uh, what's called, thank you very much for the, uh, to, to the extent that the, it's personally complimentary. Um, I don't know if, I don't know if I'm as brave, as courageous as you say I am, uh, what's got, but I do my best, uh, what's got, that's all I will ever do. Uh, and so I, I, I appreciate it and I appreciate where you're coming from and what you the, the work you've done over the years as well. Um, you know, we're, the Ireland is what this is about in the, in the end, not the National Party necessarily and certainly not just in Barrett. Um, but the traitors, the traitors have to go. I mean, let's not mess around here and say... Uh, um, that, oh, I well, just Bart's putting his ego first because he got get, he's going to get rid of Paul Conroy and he's going to get rid of James Reynolds. No, uh, I have to get rid of them now. If, I, if I'm in a position and a power to do so, I have to get these people out of the movement because they are a cancerous growth on it at this present moment. And the National Party under their leadership if it is allowed to be under their leadership, will not be fit for purpose. It will not be something that I would want to be part of, even if I were permitted to be part of it. So it's not about ego. No, it's always been about Ireland and it always has to be about Ireland. That any differences we have should be genuine differences of opinion about what is the right thing to do in any given situation. And you know, we won't always agree, um, but uh, but there's no no need no need for to, no need for us to be particularly nasty, and absolutely no need to for um, the kind of personal betrayal that I talked about earlier on. Uh, there's never any need for that. 
ever, under any circumstance. Uh, um, sorry. Is he gone again? No, oh, am back. I there? Um, uh, no crimes committed, yeah. as it were. Uh, what's caught? I don't understand. I don't understand people who 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 take take these private details of somebody's life and expose them to the public. There's no, for example, apart from anything else, there's no hypocrisy here. Uh, what's caught? I've never said. To, I've never pretended to anybody. Uh, Everybody who knows me probably has heard the story that um, in some form or other, maybe not that particular incident, but that, that, that during that time in my life, that it was a low point and, and, and my behavior was not always um, what I would be proud of. Uh, but there you go. Like, that's a, you know, human beings make mistakes. Uh, it's not for public consumption. I committed no crimes. I... Uh, I, I hurt myself probably more than anybody else and if I hurt other people uh, they weren't James Reynolds and it wasn't his place uh, to call me out as it were uh, it was nasty and there's no place for that kind of politics uh, and there's no place I'll go for further than that there's no place for that kind of person in the national movement in the movement in general, not just in the National Party, but in the movement in general. And I would say to people, if they were to meet James Reynolds in the street tomorrow, don't even talk to him. Cross the road. Don't, don't argue with him. Don't tell him. Uh, don't, don't, don't abuse him. Don't say nasty things to him. Don't, uh, uh, um, you know, don't, don't give him the, uh, with, with both barrels, is it? Just cross the road. Cross the road to the other side. It's not worth it. It's just, it's not worth it. None of them, none of them are, are, are worth the time of day of the decent people in the national movement and in the national party. They just are. Dustin, I have a question there for you. It's come in from Ireland first. I presume that's this is Derek Bloy. Um, does Justin think that James Reynolds' utterings about our international obligations to Ukraine to be a cause for concern? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. But they don't surprise me. Uh, they don't surprise me because that's exactly the kind of tacking back to the centre that I was talking about and trying to prevent. Um, they, it is... There are no, uh, let, let, uh, I'm going to go, go make a statement here on my own behalf, as far as I'm concerned. There are no international obligations that Ireland has or any Irish government has to any other people other than the Irish people. Anything else that we give or do is out of charity not obligation. And the idea that we owe the Ukrainians under, under obligation anything, we do not. We simply do not. We do not owe them anything. We do not owe them uh, the taking in of one single refugee, nor any other country in the world do we owe them to take in one single refugee. Now, whether we do or not is another question. But Specifically on the question of the Ukrainians, I think it's pretty damn obvious at this point that we have done far more than we ought to have done. And we need to roll back what some of what we have done rather than talk about we still have ongoing obligations. So that's my answer to that. Is it a cause for concern? It is a cause for, uh, if you're a member of the National Party, the party if that 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 I represented as leader and would represent as leader again. It's, it's a political position that you should run a mile from. And anybody espousing it, that Ireland, that an Irish government has obligations to anybody other than the Irish people, is, is basically abhorrent to me. I wasn't surprised to hear it because I've been hearing it quietly and I've been hearing it privately for a while. That, uh, that there are votes in softening the line. And, and maybe there are. 
I don't I don't know the answer to that actually. I don't think so, to be honest. I don't think there are. Uh, but even if there were, uh, I wouldn't do it. Uh, so yeah, no, it's more than for cause for concern. It's a cause to run a mile from anybody who's talking about Ireland's international obligations to whoever or whatever. Let's let we we need somebody to in this country to stand up and say the Irish government has obligations to the Irish people and they are not meeting those obligations and they have not met those obligations for the 70 years the state uh, what's got has been in, in existence or the republic has since the republic has been declared they have not met they did not make, make them under the free state either they did not meet their obligations to the people that they absolutely are obliged to their own people the Irish people. That's what a national party leader should be saying. That's what a national party leader would be saying if I were there. And that's what the national party was saying when I was there. And will say again, there are no international obligations whatsoever. But the Irish government and series of Irish governments and the Irish state has failed the Irish people since its foundation. And I am always reminded of something Dan Brian said is uh, what's caused after all his sacrifices and all that he had gone through. He said uh, at the end of it all in, in an interview in the 1960s, he said, I wouldn't have got out of bed for what we got. And I am afraid I have to agree with him. Um, eh, for, what, for, what it, for, for what we have now, no one, no, no one should have died for this because it's not worth it. <laughs> it's less than worth it. Uh, so international obligations, about time to, to, to start thinking about your own people. Start thinking about your own people, uh, Irish government, whoever whoever it is. And let's start putting people in government. I would say to people in general, put people in government who say that the Irish government has responsibilities to the Irish people first and the Irish people only. And anything else, anything else that we give to anybody is out of the kindness of our heart and pure charity. No obligation whatsoever. Perfect. Lovely stuff. Thank you very much for answering that question, Justin. Um, truck driver, you have your hand up. Do you want to ask one more before we uh, wrap things up? Yeah, lads, I'll, I'll keep this very quick and brief. Um, just to reiterate there on Justin, it's time to put Ireland first. And that's not a plug for a political party, but he's absolutely right. We have, we have, a, gov we have a government in situ at the moment that's putting everybody else before ourselves. Um, Justin, no offence, and I'll talk like you're not here, but he's not speaking like Einstein. This is fucking common sense. We need to look after each other, ourselves, our country, our nation, our resources, our fisheries, our everything. This is our fucking home. Like, And please, Jesus, put fucking people that have that mindset into government in the next time. There's been um, a Sunday Independent publication today where independence, and I know I know there's National Party, IFP, Ireland First, everything else in that. 12% of the vote, Greens are up too. I know it's a midterm fucking shit, but we need to keep pushing this. We need to keep pushing Ireland first, we, we, Irish people first for everything. We need to keep pushing it because the people above there will sell their fucking souls and arseholes to get their jobs in Europe. It's, it's we're yeah. left without, and it's not fucking right. And people like Justin, and I'm not going to be biased here, Herman Kelly, everybody else are, are, are lumped in there with an independent vote, thinking it's, oh, it's just some Joe Soap from somewhere, when these people have actually good ideas and ideology and plans behind what they're doing. Get behind them, people. You you, you have an unbelievable opportunity 
to get behind that ballot box and support these people, whatever your choice may be, but don't put it in the hands of the people yet again that will fucking betray us over and over and over and over. Don't do it. Get behind. Give these people a chance. Like, And I'm not pushing a political party. Give these people a chance. Give the independents a chance. Get people like Gavin into power in his local area. He can make a change. Get people like him into power in your area. They can make a change. Get the shitheads out of, of there. Get the career politicians out. Put in people that can fucking do something. Get off your holes and vote and do it right. And put the right people in to fucking make changes for your area and your people, for this country and everything else. And if we all do it together, we can make a change. It's fucking heartbreaking listening to the shite and the bullshit and everything else that comes out of, of just solely due to the incompetence of this government. And, and we let them away with it time and time again. We have to get the cunts out and put proper, competent people in that, that have their heads grounded in the roots of this soil of our land and look after the fucking people. The people yep, are there. Absolutely. They're screaming to get behind them. Thanks, guys. Sorry, I'm, I'm probably ranting, but, you know, just... No, you're get, fine. they're fine as far as I'm concerned. Anyway. Then, no, you spoke, you spoke real well there, Tucker, and I think you're... You touched on a lot of points that we're all feeling the same sort of things at the minute, aren't we? And that there, if there is like you, if there could be a bit of a alliance going forward between these parties, you know, like you, like you said, that Gavin Pepper is going to run on Thingless. It's like right, maybe the NP or the AFP or Adam first don't focus on Thingless, and you've got the independents there, and there is that grouping of people that you talked about, the independents, and everybody's in there, right? But that just, that shouldn't be, when you look at that, don't look at independence. And I know Hilly Ray and all is mixed into that. But they, that you, that should be the nationalist vote. And I think it's something, one of the polls was up to 18% of independence and other parties. I just think of it as the nationalist vote. Fucking Fianna Gael was on 18, Fianna Fáil was on 20. You know, that's the next biggest one is Sinn Féin. There's a real voter block there that you're talking about. And the more people get affected by this nonsense, the more people are going to be wanting to vote nationalist, so it is going to grow. And I think a bit of communication and a bit of talk between the different parties to go, look, there's Derek Blay. He's doing really well in Cork at the minute. Well, maybe we'll not focus on Cork. And we'll, we know that Derek's on our side, right? You know, we know that Gavin has holds the same views as us. Or there's other people across the country have the same views. Maybe we'll not focus there. We'll focus somewhere else where we could get in and get into power and... If you look across Europe at the minute, a lot of it is coalitions, right? I think in Sweden they have a coalition. Fuck it, Liam Malena, but they have a coalition, right? No, I know they're not doing what they wanted, but they have a coalition. Um, across the world, there's like they're all. There's not one dominant party. It's a coalition of different parties that are anti woke. I'm going to say that are nationalist, and I think that's a good way going forward. And I, I thought what you said was 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 very intelligent, truck driver. Chopper, are you there? I am indeed. Right, just As, um, we'll wrap it up there. Then, if there's any other questions for Justin, throw your hands up quickly before we wrap it up, uh, Toby. Uh, Justin, we always play the national anthem at the end of our spaces, so stick around for the national anthem. I'm always watching who leaves during the national anthem, and I don't forget. <laughs> I don't forget a fucking face when I see you leave during the national anthem. That sits with me. That sits with me. <laughs> So yeah, I know how you feel um, about people speaking over the national anthem as well. So uh, yeah, just, yeah. But right Justin, there. listen, thank you very much. You've given us what three and a half hours of your time tonight. I appreciate you coming on and being as forthright and honest as you have been. You've taken questions live and you haven't really refused to answer anything. So um, I've linked your YouTube, your new YouTube. I've linked it there in the comments of the space. I link your Twitter Excellent. as well, but. You know the nature of Irish Twitter. That will probably be reported by tomorrow, and it'll probably be gone. I don't. Think, I don't think that Twitter will last. If you could, uh, if you could put up my Telegram, uh, that seems to be more likely to stay up. Absolutely. And, um, yeah. Please uh, send me that I text my... message, and I'll post it for you in a separate tweet on my page. I will. Page, so I will. There's many eyes on it. I don't expect. Before. I don't expect uh, to hold on to a uh, any Twitter account for any length of time. 
Um, no, not, I don't want to imagine it. Any moment, you know, that's the word, that's the word we but live yeah, in. But yeah, thank you very much. Um, thank, and thank you. Pre- no problem. We'd appreciate it. Um, when you get an update, if you want to come back on and give people an update, whether it's good, bad, or whatever it is, I've been reading the comments and I've been getting a lot of message here, messages here. And I think regardless of the outcome, some people will be upset and the majority of people um, will, will just go along with it. I think what we're witnessing at the moment with the National Party is that a lot of them are just kind of going along with it. It just seems like a comfortable option. So um, on the wider scale, uh, among the, the, the say that the, the cultural right, people, people appreciate you coming on and being as honest as you have, have here. I've got a lot of messages from a lot of let me say significant people throughout this interview where they're 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 very impressed with the way you've you've spoken and they're very impressed with the way you've talked about personal issues and you've opened up and you've made yourself vulnerable. Um you've also taken to be a piss out of your own height and it never hurts to a bit of self deprecating humor always goes a long way. But you no know, listen, it's admirable that you've come on here. Um we've had our, our disagreements in the past, as we said uh, there's bigger things going on now at the moment. So yeah. Come on, give me a shout when you have an update and we'll bring you back on again and um, we'll have another chat. Okay, excellent, excellent. I'll talk to you soon. God bless. Thank Toby, much. get that national anthem going, my friend. Yeah, as always, I'll do it anyway. Aaron this fall. Aaron belongs to the Irish. Good night, folks, and thank you very much for tuning in. Yeah.